Good morning, uh, good morning, buongiorno, bonjour. We are starting the second day of the first edition of our teacher forum. And today, uh, we, I am really pleased to introduce you, Stefano Tura, who will be the moderator of the second day of our uh, forum. Stefano Tura, yes, we can have. Thank you, thank you. Stefano Tura is a well-known journalist, writer, and director of RAI Emilia Romagna. He has a really a great experience in journalism sector as international correspondent for RAI, which is our Italian television. Um, he covered and is covering world events, uh, for example, uh, starting from Kosovo conflict to Iran confli conflict, to Asian tsunami, to Queen Elizabeth II death, so he is uh, really experienced uh, and uh, he had uh, many, he spent many years in missions in conflict zone, election, and uh, social, political, and economic crisis. And uh, moreover, Stefano is an extraordinary, in my opinion, crime novelist. Uh, he wrote 10 books. I'm a reader of crime and I'm passionate. And these books are published in Germany and France, and so please, uh, German and French colleagues, you can find uh, Stefano Tura books, and then we'll exchange our opinion about uh, his crime stories. So we started this uh, second day of our uh, first edition of the Teaching Forum, and I hope that it is uh, an inspiring day, just like yesterday. Thank you very much. We have always our Eduardo, who is uh, <laughs> really, <laughs> A great, great subscriber. I'm so happy to have Eduardo with us because, uh, really, thank you and have a, a nice day. Thank you, Roberta, and thank you, Eduardo. I look much more younger in this picture than I actually am, and I like very much the novel with the knives coming out from the pages. But anyway, <laughs> okay, thank you, Roberta, and welcome to everybody. Let's start with the, the second day of the first edition of the Teacher Forum, a significant opportunity for knowledge exchange and discussion among professionals from Italian and uh, European school. Let's have a look at the program of uh, today. This morning we begin with summaries from the uh, reporters of reporters, it depends on what to uh, explain on yesterday afternoon's workshop. This is a, an important moment for sharing reflections that come from the daily practice of those leaving the school experience with different educational systems. The present teacher form could not overlook the true Copernican revolution we are experiencing, namely the advent of artificial intelligence in our lives. That's why after the coffee break, we'll discuss artificial intelligence with two experts. Uh, this will be followed by two panels with representatives from the world of the European School. In the afternoon we will also have the honor of listening to Ilana Sicurel, member of the European Parliament and of the EU Committee on Culture and Education. Before the conclusion, uh, former inspector Amilcare Bori will help us on focus on what, uh, as an external observer, appears to be the most relevant issues. We are delighted to once have again uh, the talented Eduardo Massa with us, uh, and please make an applause to Eduardo. <laughs> <laughs> His sharp, uh, stimulating drawings uh, will continue to partner our discussion also today. So let's get started. And uh, we'd like to thank the teachers from the European School of Parma who are about to take the stage for accepting the role of reporters on yesterday's workshop. But the first one we will hear is uh, Antonio De Caro. <laughs> Good morning, Antonio. Please take a seat. His report is titled How to Handle Artificial Intelligence in the Context of a Geographic Project. Please. Can you hear me? Okay. Check if the microphone is on. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I think so, yeah. So I'm the icebreaker. 
As already said, uh, my name is Antonio De Carlo, teacher here in this school, and I am reporting about this interesting workshop of yesterday afternoon about AI use in the context of geography projects by two geography colleagues uh, from Brussels to Volwi, Katarina Wilke and uh, Marielle Prince, for pupils of the secondary cycles, namely S4 and S5 classes. Okay, teaching and learning activities proposed. Uh, the colleagues followed mostly the, the jigsaw pattern. That means that pupils mm, can be divided into expert groups at first and then share groups later in order to generate maps, collect data through specific AI tools specific for geography so um, that, that they can design a new urban scenario. More precisely, redesign the school building and its environs through concept maps, campaigns and advertisements for campaigns, portfolios and different kinds of presentations and exhibitions. Our work atmosphere wa was yesterday relaxed, creative and attentive. The most relevant innovations proposed, how to use AI apps and tools such as Eurostat, GIS, GeoAI, MapChart and others for geography projects. At the same time, how to avoid the misuse of AI through specific assessment structures, for instance, Sway. I don't know whether you already know this, uh, this kind of presentation uh, tool, but Sway doesn't allow pupils to copy and paste uh, long essays because Sway is structured through uh, shorter blocks, uh, both text and also picture blocks, so that pupils have to think how to connect one block with, uh, with the other, and, and they, are, um, they need to, to think about a general, overall, well-motivated structure. This is uh, one of the advantages of Sway. In order to avoid misuse uh, uh, for assessment, the secret are multi-layered tasks that combine, for example, research with visualization and also text production. Remarkable teaching methodologies and activities. Essentially, the idea that AI have, has to be guided by humans. Uh, this, this is called human agency by the most recent also European rules and documents. So guided use of AI both to prompt and to evaluate the results of the machine interrogation. Prompt, prompt engineering is really the key because we human teachers and pupils have to ask more and more precise questions to the AI in order to achieve the result we want to achieve. This is one aspect of the European dimension, so this human agency. The other one is the environmental awareness specific for geography and urban geography, so that we can transform a city and its neighborhood according to basic city functions and also sustainability. Lessons learned. On the one side, we have, we could say, Normal, normal activities and normal achievements in uh, a setting of learning by doing, such as train digi digital competencies, practice research skills, and organize debates and presentations. But since new tools can foster new skills, we think that uh, the most important new skill we have to learn together with the pupils uh, to use properly AI is critical thinking, because AI can product texts or image, we have to assess, evaluate, and use critically. Pupils with special education needs uh, can find in those projects uh, a very friendly setting due to differentiated activities, not only text reading or text production, but also field studies, interviews, individual and group research, sketching, creating surveys, advertisements, and overall visualizations. Visualizations are an important inclusion strategy because they convey information not only through texts but also through uh, pictures and images. In this sense, proper use of AI may strengthen pupils' autonomy also at home. 
The key elements for successful replicability of this project are how to create, also in other subjects, classwork that implements AI tools, including how to use them and discuss their links, and how to create specific homework tasks that cannot be done completely by relying only on AI tools. And as for assessment, another important advice is the combination of several factors. In this case, for example, combination of peer assessment through forms and through the teachers. I think it's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Antonio. <laughs> Let's now listen to Luca Ponte. Welcome, Luca. The title of the report is Artificial Intelligence and uh, Entrepreneurship. Please. Mm. Per, uh, però devo uscire da qui. Uh, we need help for the with the laptop to... Very short. Mi si sente? So I'm very pleased to uh, talk about this second project on AI and entrepreneurship, namely in artificial intelligence. And uh, the time is very limited to say all the beautiful things that we did yesterday. I will try my best to summarize as much as I possible and reporting the best lesson learned and uh, the, the most outstanding uh, activities we did. So we try to understand how to blend project-based learning with ICT, entrepreneurship, AI in learning activities. So the main focus is to catch the attention of the students and nurture the spirit of the, entrep the entrepreneurial uh, mindset, which serve them well in the future, in a future that we can only uh, dream of, in the, um, because AI is changing very fast our reality as citizens and as professionals. So we discussed about the Entecom frameworks, the key features that offers for regular didactics, and how to put a pinch of AI in our regular lessons to capture the attention of the students. And we showcase examples that our brilliant colleague, Sofia Misirlaki, uh, did with this, her students for two editions of her project. And basically, she succeeded very quickly with a project under the guidelines of the Entrecom framework to vehiculate even the most difficult topic of her syllabus in a very brilliant and successful way. She asked students to create their own digital business idea and she win hands down. And also it's a win-win situation for both sides of the learning activity. So we did the same. Yesterday we were students of her doing our homeworks, so generating our AI idea. But this time as teachers tailored for educational needs of the community that we serve. And the results were very interesting. We used design tools like Canva and then we were ready to assess and evaluate the outcome of the project. And this is for one of the examples, no teachers, no teaching, a database that serves the schools for uh, finding possible teachers when we have to replace teachers for more than a week, also provide students with po uh, resources to um, cope with this absence of the teacher. So overall, we have a double uh, winning situation because we also cover multiple um, plethora of key competencies at, uh, along with the regular curricular competencies, and this is multidisciplinary approach. 
So just to come to an end, the most relevant innovation proposed is just using learning strategies involving artificial intelligence. And what is remarkable is the project-based learning approach with hands-on activities, it's a perfect combination with artificial intelligence. What is the best uh, contribution to the European dim dimension? Foster students' creativity and most of all, entrepreneurial mindset to build resilience for the challenges they had to face ahead. The lesson learned, artificial intelligence pervades our daily routines and bring both significant benefits and potential risks. So in this perspective, students must understand the AI logic behind any process involving AI and strengthening their entrepreneurial aptitude. This is um, why we are facing a fast-paced transformation created by AI itself, and it's due to the democratization of the technology. Technology is everywhere in our pockets. And they have to thrive through this transformation as citizens and as professionals. So in our case, when it comes to educational needs, different educational needs or special ones, AI may facilitate teaching, learning, and assessment practices, educator side and learner side, with tailored specific tools that we can create locally as a network of school, or even more globally, overall the European system network of sc uh, European schools. So AI also is a way to raise the bar when it comes to increased development of transversal skills. And many of them are self-esteem enhancements, cultural awareness, communication, teamwork. So overall, the key elements for the replicability of this project a successful replicability is that this project is inherently scalable, multidisciplinary, ICT plus all the set of disciplines involved, and it's a template, it's a blueprint for any subject, language and learning area. I thank you for your attention. Anyway, I, I thank you very much, Luca, for your report. And uh, I ask Benedetta Toni to join me at the table. Is ah, he's there? <laughs> Benedetta Toni. The title is "Winter in Nursery Cycle." Please, Benedetta. Winter in Nursery uh, Cycle. The project has been realized by the accredited European School of Parma, and the topic was Early Childhood Education and Care. The teachers conducting the workshop were Anita Pucinieski, Linda Sivor, in collaboration with Camilla Libert. Other teachers involved were Veronique Christoffel, Cathy Bouvet, Josie Crippa Carmo, Sabrina Borcini, and Patrizia Volpicella. The cycle is nursery, and the student involved uh, were the three sections of nursery, almost uh, 70 students. What are the teaching and learning activities proposed? The topic, uh, the theme was winter, and uh, the topic has been interpreted by each section in various ways. The French section focus uh, story was uh, um, on the story La Muffle, but for the workshop, uh, the story was pro proposed in the English version, The Myth. The story is a fairy tale of Ukrainian origin produced by the editor in different languages and used as, as a L2 resource for English, German, and French. There is also an Italian version, La Mufola Rossa, and in our school, Italian is uh, taught as L2 from the first primary, first grade primary class. Which is the main uh, aim, uh, the main uh, outcome of the project uh, was uh, 
uh, of the project and also of the workshop was to strengthen L1 through a series of activities that included the discovery of the world, depicting a fairy tale with a set of resources created by the children, manual activities uh, and sensory experiences. The story can be used both in uh, uh, sexual languages but also in European hours in nursery. We have uh, the chance uh, to promote European hours also in nursery. The focus map uh, was really articulated before there, was, uh, there were two phases of discovery of the world, then the reading aloud of the story, and finally the creative uh, atelier. The workshop has been articulated in different moments. Uh, the introduction of the digital documentation, which, which was proposed uh, on January, the presentation and the reading aloud of the story, uh, the listening to the story, uh, noting the language musicality and the richness vocabulary, memorizing the plot, uh, forming collective opinions that represent the story, and then the four ateliers, to make a meet and with fabric representing the character from the story, to tell the story with the puppets, uh, to make and paint the helmets uh, and realize the carnival with the characters of the story. The interaction, uh, the atmosphere, was created by the environment. The book, the glove, the puppets, and the color helmets were the environments that inspired the impact, uh, a, a very uh, joyful and creative impact on learning. The atmosphere was really uh, joyful, full of energy, uh, enthusiasm, and passion. There was a room of, of discussion and collaboration. The most relevant innovation proposed, the project used multilingual material. The writing of the text is poetic and musical, even in the translated versions. The text is uh, rich in high fre frequencies, first uh, and second vocabulary. This is very important because uh, there is a, a chance uh, with uh, storytelling uh, to um, acquire uh, a very rich vocabulary from, from nursery. In the artistic atelier, questioning related to memorization and recapitulation of the story, but also questioning that enhance students' creative thinking. The, there are many studies uh, based on the uh, questioning, uh, not uh, just memorization, but also um, questioning concerning dramatization, inference, evaluation, and creation that uh, was appli were applied in the project and during the, wor the workshop, which has the, the link of the early education curriculum of the European school. Holistic approach and active learning the creative uh, teaching um, in multiple ways, uh, in multiple ways, uh, the inquiry approach, the creative methodologies, the play, and of course the awareness of the mother tongue, but also the familiarization with uh, other languages. At in the same time, there are the same links with the indicazioni uh, nazionali per il curriculo della scuola dell'infanzia. Symbolic play as a form of expression and personal re reworking, the space of learning, which is functional and inviting, the competencies uh, that uh, are uh, intended uh, and understood in a global and unified manner, the quality and aesthetic interaction with the, with the materials and with the atelier, the use of mother tongues uh, and of other languages. Children explore reality while learning representation through asking questions. What kind of contribution to the European dim dimension? Of course, the intersection of languages, the contact of languages uh, in uh, horizontally, but also vertically, but also the uh, awareness of kinesthetic approaches and the acquisition of language, rhythm, and melody for a way by the way of voice, body, and movement use. Which is the lesson uh, learned? The story expresses the feeling of kindness and welcome, the glove, represent a home or a shelter from the cold for animals. Hospitality is a founding value for uh, an intercultural learning community that is learned uh, from an early age. At the same time, uh, the animal model suggests uh, a living model that aids in uh, understanding the most basic processes and ways of living and coping with the winter cold. The competence acquired are, of course, all the key competencies, but also the high touch aptitudes uh, um, uh, underlined by Pink in uh, his book, uh, The Whole Mind, design, story, symphony, empathy, play, and meaning. What are the impact of the different educational needs of pupil students? Of course, the project is extremely inclusive uh, and this, mm, there is a, 
an involvement of the, uh, all the multiple intelligence presen presented in each uh, child, and then the holistic approach. Which are the key elements for successful replicability of the project? Of course, in the European context, the project-based learning methodology uh, is really used, widely used, and there is uh, a chance to um, replicable, uh, replicability. Uh, on the same at the same time, in the Italian context, uh, there is uh, an initial uh, introduction to a foreign language, uh, in particular English. The care for educational uh, environment, the refined choice of materials, uh, theater as a form of linguistic uh, internalization and expression, the value of, of art and digital documentation are all typical traits of both the European school system and the national system. And here, are some pictures of the first workshop and some pictures uh, of the second uh, workshop uh, where was present also my colleague uh, Alexia, deputy director uh, in Brussels, and we were very proud to have her in our workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benedetta. Let's listen to uh, Silvana Spagnoli. She's going to speak about Camisci by Le Trésor de l'Océan. Correct? <laughs> Please, Silvana. Good morning. I'm, I was the rapporteur for this innovative and captivating project that was presented yesterday by Valerie Kirchhoff and Diane Harriman from the European School of uh, Strasbourg, and I hope I do them justice. Um, during this interactive workshop, they explained and showed, showed us how storytelling can be developed through the use of a kamishibai, a portable form of Japanese street theatre and a unique form of storytelling using illustrated boards that are inserted into a miniature stage-like device. The narrator reads the story written on the back of the boards and adds sound effects and expression to make the stories come to life. Among the various stories they showed us was Le Trésor de l'Océan, uh, which was carried out by year two primary classes, harmonized in the three language sections, French, English, and German. Um, it highlights an important topic about pollution in the sea and develops children's awareness about protecting one's own environment and ecosystem in an engaging and creative way, making it a more meaningful experience. It encompasses and promotes most of the key competences set out in the European framework for lifelong learning developing skills in literacy, multilingualism, science and technology, social and learning to learn, entrepreneurship and cultural expression. The Kamishibai can be used as a vehicle to develop skills in planning, creativity, working cooperatively in groups, plurilingualism and oral pre presentation. Firstly, the children listen to the story being told by an adult, then they develop the text, props and sounds to accompany their version of the story. And we all had a go at that yesterday, which was great fun. And this is an excellent example of a cross-curricular project where the children develop their skills and learning in a variety of subjects. In L1, they develop their oral and communication skills, listening to each other, gathering information and presenting their work. Through the hands-on art activities, they learn how to use and manipulate a variety of materials and display them creatively. Developing skills in design and technology interpreting and expressing the story in their own way, promoting the holistic development of the pupil. The expected outcomes for the pupils through this activity are to develop social skills, collaboration in group and peer work, develop creativity and expression, learning to learn through a meaningful hands-on activity, develop research skills, 
oral presentation and plurilingualism, in which children can develop the identity of their own language and cultural awareness. The teachers guided each group by giving them one particular scene or part of the story which they had to develop and represent in 3D using recyclable materials, a captivating and ingenious way to spread an important message to everyone involved, creators and audience alike. Throughout the project Le Trésor de l'Océan, the children developed their knowledge of animals and their characteristics, in particular sea creatures, in a creative way, hence developing the skill of learning to learn through their curiosity of the world. In so doing, they have also learned about the geography of the oceans and rivers. The Kamishibai can be used as an innovative introduction of any topic, and all children, regardless of age or ability, can learn to cooperate as a team, each taking responsibility for their role within that team and taking pride in achieving a unanimous goal. It is a child-centered activity where the teacher is a facilitator and guide, providing a learning environment that provo promotes active learning. Children are engaged in an open-ended challenge to be solved through debate, experimentation, exploration, and creativity that foster key competencies through continuous learning and peer-to-peer -peer support. Through this project, the children are given the opportunity to integrate and interact with pupils of diverse European national, cultural, and linguistic backgrounds. They can learn from each other how various social issues can be tackled in various countries in Europe, fostering cultural awareness and nurturing responsible global citizens. Through this type of project, children can develop self-confidence, a feeling of belonging and contributing to a group team activity, giving them a sense of achievement and accomplishment. Music could be added, or children could use voiceovers to develop their skills in digital competencies. A project like this can only impact positively on all children and adults involved, highlighting an important message in a fantastical and subtle story-like way, loved by all, young and old. The key elements to this successful delivery is its simplicity and poignancy. The children will understand that together we can learn and create something wonderful. This project can be replicated without difficulty as the resources are easily ac accessible. All children can participate as it is versatile and highly adaptable. It captures children's love of storytelling, inspiring them to express themselves through role play and oral communication in a fun and engaging way. Language is the principal means of human communication, an integral part to learning, and is a central influence in the learning process. Children learn language, but they also learn through language. It helps the child to clarify and interpret experience, to acquire new concepts, and to add depth to concepts already grasped. This innovative introduction of a topic through the Kamishibai helps pupils apply these skills in a visual way and also helps develop creative and multilingual language communication. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvana. I'm asking Cristina De Simone to join us. Welcome, Cristina. <laughs> We now speak about Web Radio Scolaire. Good morning to everyone. My name is Cristina De Simone. I'm the rapporteur for La Web Radio Scolaire. The workshop was conducted by two primary teachers coming from Brussels too, Madame Marcelle Maria Luciana and Monsieur Philippe Caillon. The project involved four groups of pupils from the fourth year of primary school, more precisely, L1 and L2 students coming from different language section. Uh, first of all, the workshop facilitator briefly described 
the various stages involved in setting up a school wet radio station. They presented the equipment used in the recorded studio, the, such as the handheld recorder, microphones, headphones, mixing console. Initially, we did a nice writing activity just to, in order to get to know uh, each other a little bit better. Then we watch a video of a recording session and we listen to the students' work. Uh, participants were divided into small working groups and chose their radio format and the topic to be covered. Some participants picked the interview, others prefer working, others prefer working on a, um, other prefer working on a spot for the teachers forum of next year. It was very interesting. <laughs> Other, other participants decided to, um, to prepare a spot in different languages. It was Italian, English, French, and Danish as well. Uh, they worked in groups on radio writing. They had to produce, as I said, a short oral text respecting the rules of codes of writing, of radio writing. So the message had to be short, clear, and precise. After that, we had a simulation of an editorial meeting. Each group recorded its own text, and finally we listened to the final product, to their podcast. What are the expected outcomes for pupils or students? Students are expected to record a podcast in the recording studio, work on radio writing, understanding the difference between oral and written languages. So no difficult words, no long sentences, just a little bit more spoken language. They also followed some voice activities for breathing, for instance, for articulation of sounds, and also for diction. At the end of the project, the, um, the students should be familiar with uh, Audacity, which is a free software for recording and auditing audio. In the end, they were supposed to upload the podcast to the audio blog platform of the school. Of course, by doing that, they develop their digital and technical skills. The aim of the project is to create a kind of a bridge between primary and secondary school, just to uh, ensure a smooth transition into secondary education. In the medium term, the podcast will evolve in a full-fledged radio program. As for the interaction, the working atmosphere, I have to say that uh, um, participants were all very, were, were highly, were highly motivated they asked lots of questions about equipment, about the students' competencies, about their families, and uh, mm, it was very, very nice to, uh, to follow. Also, they asked information and uh, questions about uh, the difficulties that uh, they might arise uh, from this uh, workshop. There was a good cooperation within the group, and uh, communication exchanges were efficient and of course, we had a constant uh, support from our facilitators. What are the pedagogical and didactic innovations? Of course, as you can imagine, is a cross-curricular experience which promotes the holistic development of the pupil because it covers different areas of languages different, uh, sorry, uh, areas of learning, such as languages, ICT, arts, history, and music. It stimulates uh, multilingualism and a multicultural approach. Students discover also the codes of radio writing and understand the difference between the two uh, register, between written and oral communication. They develop by doing that, they develop curiosity, creativity, and critical thinking, leading to an independent learning. 
They also strengthen their digital skills because they have the opportunity to manipulate the entire chain of the web radio. What are the remarkable teaching methodologies and activities? The project was, uh, um, the project was based on Frini pedagogy. The focus is on cooperation. As you know, Frini is uh, an important pedagogue, uh, important for cooperative learning especially. So the focus was on cooperation, which is the key to success, also for students uh, a little bit weaker, let's say, or with a diagnosis. We did activities on the different radio formats, discovering and understanding the particularities of each format. We also listened to uh, interviews, quizzes, and advertisements from the students. What kind of contribution to the European dimensions? As you can imagine, the project covers most of the key competences for lifelong learning, like citizenship and ethics education, critical thinking and social media literacy, entrepreneurial skills, inclusive education, multilingualism, and cultural awareness and expression. As for the impact on the development of pupils' knowledge and competencies, of course, it's a fun educational activity because uh, normally students uh, enjoy a lot during this uh, activity. It's a cross-curricular experience because it covers different areas. And uh, it promotes, uh, as I said before, multilingualism and multiculturalism. So the lesson learned is cooperation is the key to success. I would like to conclude my presentation with a quote from this uh, pedagogue, Célestin Frenet. La coopération entre les enfants est fondamentale pour construire un climat de confiance et favoriser leur développement social. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christina. Next one is Jennifer Milani. Jennifer Milani, the report title is uh, European Citizens in Nursery and Primary. Good morning, esteemed colleagues. <clears throat> My name is Jennifer, and today I'd like to report back from Matru Giro and Inguina Lange's workshop. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, their project, Why Postpone Citizenship Education for Future European Citizens Until Tomorrow, was chosen as the proposal for addressing the area of European citizens in nursery and primary. This project involved over 50 students from the nursery classes from the European School Brussels 1, the Birkendale site, and has been in operation for five years. The project addressed the importance of teaching children how to be good European citizens from a young age. It is an all-encompassing project to entice a child's natural curiosity, resulting both Individual, group achieve, uh, individual and group achievements through interaction, discussion, and play. It is divided into two parts, weekly Europe, European time lessons and what it means to be European starting from nursery. While the project offered multiple teaching and learning activities, I would like to draw your attention to the cross-curricular activities provided, linking all language sections, initially beginning with the with creating awareness for other languages and cultures, then establish further employing activities by means of communication, dance, games, art, music, food, 
to enhance targeted learning objectives. The students were given real life learning opportunities, such as talking to World War II veterans, members of parliament, designing illustrations for their own published history book, visiting the European Parliament, uh, intercultural exchanges, and so on. Students completed success certificates to be integrated into their achievements and personal progress portfolios, demonstrating the knowledge acquired. Uh, the workshop participants were enthusiastic, fully engaged, and very chatty. Mathieu and the Inguina set the scene, depicting a classroom atmosphere, teaching Latvian, encouraging us to reflect on how children truly feel in such a multilingual environment. The workshop was a wonderful occasion to interact with like-minded individuals who have shared knowledge and experience on the subject, providing a stimulating amb ambient, promoting the early education curriculum skill that living alongside one another doesn't automatically lead to intercultural understanding and a European spirit. Instead, leaning towards the argument that it is education that contributes to it. Building on one's own prior knowledge, teachers invited children to share and question, consequently crafting worthwhile learning dynamics for everyone involved. Multilingual language communication was encouraged across all language sectors. Hands-on activities such as presenting Europe visually and physically by having students join hands in a circle, demonstrated to students that each pupil has their place in the group be seen by all and thus see everyone else as a perfect exemplar for why the European countries originally came together. The project encouraged a team atmosphere as classes met weekly, communicating in four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Latvian. During the European time lessons, students covered three core content areas from the early education curriculum. It's me as a person, me and the others, and me in the world. It addressed key skills such as communication in foreign languages and development of social and civic competences, encompassing all language sections, including SWOLs, thus supporting harmonized planning and continuity both horizontally and vertically. Moreover, to accentuate learning further, the school is required to embark on promoting tolerance uh, intercultural understanding and a European spirit immediately from nursery. The enlightening lesson plan is student-based addressing three of the fundamental European key competences for lifelong learning, multilingual competence, citizenship competence, cultural awareness and expression competence. To evidence its contribution to the European dimension, numerous well-planned and presented tasks were proposed. Examples were learning strategic vocabulary in foreign languages, cultural dances and games, international cuisine, creative workshops, followed by ambitious lessons to boost knowledge and understanding of the European Union's diversity. Each activity ensured children gained invaluable growth both personally as well as understanding the European school environment in which they're an intrinsic part of. Students take proprietorship by their, of their learning by interviewing grandparents and family members, thus personalizing their knowledge with real life examples. These were then broadcasted on a school's website, enforcing the concept of from learners to knowledge transmitters as the pupils themselves became European reporters, investigating the difference between I know and I think. It is believed that this project can be successfully replicated, no, it is believed, but I also believe, uh, replicated across European schools as similar projects are already in place. However, it is fundamental that creating a European spirit begins as early as nursery education, alongside strong communication and, of course, harmonized planning between all involved. The proposed lessons have been designed to easily allow for differentiation as students are placed on an equal playing field due to everything being taught in multiple languages, accommodating, therefore, everyone. In addition, the possibility to share best practice scenarios in person 
by school coordinators would aid the project to grow positively within European schools. To conclude, I am confident that this project pays homage to the importance of the European school system. Its multiculturalism is essential to its realization through discovery, understanding, and exchanging ideas. By initiating in a European spirit immediately from nursery, fashions tolerance and awareness of the, its importance worldwide. I would like to acknowledge Matthew and Nguina for their proposal and personally thank the workshop participants for making this such a rewarding experience. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Let's move on to Margarita Caro Fernandez, who will be reporting about a secondary school musical theater inclusion. Please, Margarita, morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here this morning to present a project that came to us from the European School of Alicante. Uh, it is uh, a project created by Ms. Nicholson and Ms. Fisher, and it is a complete plurilingual uh, production of music and theater, and it is uh, specifically created for an audience. Uh, as you all know, yesterday we had uh, workshops in the, uh, in the um, afternoon, and we had the pleasure of having uh, uh, one of the former uh, principals of the European School of Alicante uh, as an attendee of the workshop. And he said uh, to, the all, uh, to all participants, and I'm quoting, that this was one of the most uh, motivational and inspirational and life-changing uh, projects uh, that he has ever seen. So yesterday, um, let me see if I'm able to, okay. Yesterday, during the, um, the workshop, the project was presented by Ms. Um, Nicholson and Ms. Fisher, and uh, <coughs> they offer a wide variety of activities. Um, we had uh, open sessions of, <coughs> I'm sorry, of questions and answers, uh, problems and solutions, uh, um, cooperative working, uh, pair work, group work, and the uh, atmosphere was really very nice, very calm, relaxed. Uh, it was very funny and uh, very fresh and, uh, and quick. Uh, and uh, they tried to make uh, everyone understand uh, how the students uh, felt uh, during the, the whole project. Um, what is expected uh, for the... Okay, so what, what is the expected outcome for pupils and students? Uh, of course, as uh, we said before, this is a plurilingual, a complete plurilingual musical and theater production created for an audience. And from uh, the participation on this project, the students gain a holistic role in a variety of, of fields. Uh, so uh, we are talking about inclusion, linguistic proficiency, mutual respect, uh, um, growth in self-esteem, uh, creativity, uh, appreciation of the richness of different cultures, and, um, and much more. Um, what are the most relevant innovations proposed? So the, um, the main thing with this project is that it is a fully collaborative project. So it goes uh, across uh, year groups, so all the secondary, we go from S1 to S7, across all the linguistic sections, uh, with all the uh, school team, uh, with the maintenance team, uh, with the parents, with people from outside the school, uh, mm, professionals from the canteen, uh, uh, all uh, uh, a, a big variety of uh, stakeholders are uh, uh, working together, and in addition to that, it is a sustainable project. Uh, because um, um, materials are uh, recycled materials and the props are also presented and proposed for uh, 
the years to come, and uh, when they have to look for the customs, they try to use also second-hand uh, um, customs. Now, the teaching methodologies, uh, uh, the remarkable teaching methodologies, I think uh, we can uh, sum everything up by saying, and this is uh, quite amazing, that the eight key competencies, all of them are implemented in one single project. Uh, um, for all the teachers here, you know how uh, difficult, uh, if not impossible, it is to uh, implement uh, the eight competencies in one single project, but it is completely true. Um, you are maybe thinking, how can math be implemented in, uh, in a musical? But uh, I, um, I will not unveil the secrets, and I really encourage all of you to take a look uh, at the project, because uh, it is true. It is true, and uh, from the fact that all the uh, key competencies are implemented, the project is inclusive. And uh, other methodologies that um, are being uh, put into place here are team building, confidence building, transfer all of skills, teacher's feedback, peer's feedback, and uh, new ways of learning. The contribution to the European dimension, um, as we can gather from um, what I've been saying, uh, there is going to be a <coughs> mutual respect uh, for different heritages, for different cultures, for different backgrounds, uh, and uh, the cultural understanding that comes from a hands-on project. And uh, it also somehow celebrates uh, the cultural diversity and richness. The lessons learned, uh, I decided to use uh, a sentence uh, that we all know that it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, since it is a fully collaborative, collaborative project, uh, everyone is involved uh, and uh, we learn uh, not only by ourselves but also by looking at what others are, are doing. So uh, we learn by doing, we learn, we learn by, uh, as we said before, teachers and peers' feedback, and uh, we also learn uh, by observation. <coughs> now, the impact on different educational needs of uh, pupils or students, uh, I used uh, a sentence that uh, Ms. Nicholson and uh, Ms. Fisher used for their castings, and uh, it says there is, there is something for everyone. So uh, it's completely multidisciplinary, and all kind of skills are required. So when they, uh, they cast for this uh, show, for this production, they're looking for actors, screenwriters, uh, construction team, uh, social manager, social media manager, um, artist management, uh, artist, um, I'm sorry, a makeup artist, uh, uh, sound and lightning technicians, so as you can see, all kind, of, if you think about your students, all kind of students can really participate uh, in, this, uh, in this project. Uh, I asked uh, uh, Ms. Nicholson and uh, Ms. Fisher to tell me which were the key elements for replicability of the project, and they were uh, brilliant by answering me, answering me with uh, two uh, uh, key words, so funding, and scheduling. So those are the, the main items uh, if you want to replicate the project. Um, I want to finish uh, with, uh, with a very well-known uh, sentence that the, there is, um, a picture is worth uh, 1,000 words. So I encourage you all to take a look at the videos and uh, the pictures that will be uploaded uh, later that uh, Ms. Nicholson and uh, Ms. Fisher has prepared for, for all of you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Now, Diletta Prezioso, reporting on exchanging program for the inclusion of social uh, cognitive development. Good morning, everyone. 
So the title of the project proposal is Legio Octava Challenge Project. And the topic is about inclusion, social and cognitive development of pupils with specific educational needs. The names of the teachers uh, conducting the workshop are Anna Bella Santos and Celine Legal. There, thank you. The students involved uh, are uh, the gift, high achievers, and highly motivated pupils in a secondary cycle. So, what were, which were the teaching and learning activities proposed? The challenge program, Legio Octava, is an interdisciplinary club inspired by the historical fact that the um, area of Karlsruhe was conquered by the Romans, namely by the Legio Octava. It proposed many activities, uh, interdisciplinary, physical, manual, and mediation ones. For example, the students um, acquire a culture of antiquity and a critical mind, but the, they don't not only learn about the, language, the Latin language, but also learn by the biology teacher about plants and remedies for legionaries in the Roman army. They also reproduce the scenes of attacks and uh, complete the construction of many artifacts, such as a groma, a cardboard model uh, of a domus, a segment of a lorica, etc. And at the end of the project, they became cultural mediators during the transition phase between primary and secondary, or when adults visited the school, transmitting them the knowledge they had acquired. Which are the expected outcomes? So they develop many uh, competences, literacy and multilingual competences. They obviously learn about language, uh, in Latin in particular, and uh, its role in learning European languages. They also learn how to build elements. They took photo for videos and wrote a journalistic article for the Erx Mag, that is uh, the magazine of all the European schools. And they also discovered the Latin culture and living life of a Roman legionaries. They also explained the project to other students. So all the um, key competencies are um, developed which was the interaction uh, during the workshop. Uh, the interaction was very cooperative because teachers reflected about the opportunity of recreating uh, the challenge program in their own schools. And they also thought about the opportunity of promoting a festival of ancient culture in the European schools. What are the most relevant innovation proposed? The challenge program is an opportunity for gifted but also talented and highly motivated students to develop their potential discovering the life of Roman legionaries through extra activities and projects. And at the end of the project, students had a final product to show and with the help of a professional troupe recreated and installed in the school at Roman camp. What are the remarkable teaching methodologies and activities? The challenge program is developed in several levels. Differentiated activities in the classroom and extra classroom with specific areas. The, it develops social skills such as empathy, life skills, autonomous learning, and Latin is learned using a kinetic approach. What kind of contribution to the European dimension? The students are encouraged to find their roots and to value their linguistic European heritage. They also discovered the role of Latin etymology in facilitating the learning of European languages. But the highest achievements will be to organize in a different European school at least every two years an event called Festival of Ancient Culture with a new theme related to antiquity. So what are the lessons learned? The challenge program promotes the inclusion of pupils who are gift or talented and allows them to fully develop their cognitive potential. Also, the assessment is not by grades, but is qualitative and informative. And what are the impact on the different educational needs of students? The impact of role playing is very positive. Students document the learning process uh, and they became the um, actors of the learning process. Shy and social, as social purpose, including several autistic ones, are involved as well. 
So what are the key elements for successful replicability of the project? The in-depth study of a subject from fiction to knowledge, making artifacts with the help of a supporting network, such as parents, teachers, purpose as cultural mediators, uh, and um, in the school, you can also think about an organization of an event on the school site or outside in partnership with a cultural association. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Diletta. Let's now listen to Florence Roman, is it correct? Okay. He's reporting on uh, Creativity Extended or Cre-I-T-V-T Extended, isn't it? <laughs> Please. Good morning, everyone. I will uh, present you the second workshop from the School of Karlsruhe. The title is Creativity Extended. IT is for Intelligent Technologies. The two teachers are Eva Katsirafelidou, sorry for the pronunciation, and Josefa Bourgogne. And it covers all the classes of the primary cycle. Creativity Extended is an interdisciplinary project focused on the environmental and climate crisis topic. The teachers wanted to take advantage of the multilingual environment of their classes. Uh, teaching and learning activities in P1 and P2 they created some multilingual weather reports in the L2 classes. To reach this goal, uh, the, the teacher proposed different activities, memory games, interactive digital games, bingo, flashcard games, etc., in order to cooperate and also, of course, improve the vocabulary. And then in P3, 4, and 5, um, the teacher proposed the creation of a multilingual rap song with the Swalls students. Um, the same, step by step, they, they prepared the song. First of all, they discussed about the topics. Then they did a brainstorming to record ideas, keywords, in order to write the lyrics of the song. After that, they took care of the technical aspect by using, um, first of all, the GarageBand application to create the melody, the rhythm, uh, to, to mix the voices. And then they also did a video uh, clip using uh, Sketchy School app and other tools. What are the main outcomes for pupils? Increasing the awareness of environmental and climate crisis I issues and developing civic competences. Understand and express the topic in a creative way by using new technologies. Increasing the European dimension by using all the languages spoken by the students. It is a cross-curricular project, discovery of the world, L1, L2, art, music, and also mathematics, and also increasing linguistic and intercultural skills. How was the atmosphere in the group? Uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, Eva and Josefa were very passionate about their project and they gave us their passion. We also had a very pleasant time by uh, experiments with the apps in a hands-on way. Uh, the teacher gave us very concrete tools and it was, it was very interesting. 
what are the most relevant innovation proposed? The multilingual communication for the two parts of the project, the weather reports and the rap song, and the use of technologies. So we had uh, the opportunity to experiment, uh, experiment the garage band app. You can see a picture. Eva is explaining us how to use uh, the application. And uh, we, we had the, the opportunity to see a final product. So we could understand that also for the pupils, uh, it is very stimulating. And then you see uh, a picture of uh, a picture of the green screen. Our colleague is telling about the weather in Italy yesterday. Uh, Josefa is recording, and then we put some animations, uh, draws, a flag, so we, we could uh, uh, discover all the process. What are the remarkable teaching methodologies and activities? For the parts done in P1 and P2, at the beginning of the activity, the pupils choose the language they are more comfortable with. Then they will switch into the L2 language. Each pupil present the weather for one day of the week in a European country whose language they speak. Then they will reinvest what they did but by presenting the weather report in their second language. Uh, that aspect was very important because the teacher explained us that the group of students were very sh uh, was very shy. And so they could become more confident by using, at the beginning, the, the dominant language. It was also the way, a way to exchange and uh, to have uh, a dialogue between different languages. And then in P3 to P5, uh, for the Swartz students, um, it was also a mix of languages. When they recorded the song, pupils have the opportunity to compare the sounds, become familiar with, with the pronunciation, and find similarities between the different languages. So uh, that aspect is uh, very important. And of course, for both activities, students use the application. They become more autonomous, and uh, at the end, they are very proud of the results. It is a stimulating way to learn. What kind of contribution to the European dimension? The awareness of the European and mondial dimension of the climate crisis for the, for the pupils. Each student uh, explain his understanding of the phenomenon and share with the others. And then the multilingual communication. The project is linked to the celebration of the European Day of Languages in September. The impact of the de on the development of pupils' knowledge and competencies. Hello. The different activities, of course, allow differentiation. And the project is also a part of the challenge program that they have in Karlsruhe, and it is an opportunity for gifted and talented and also motivated pupils to develop their potential through extra activities and projects. So it was linked to, uh, to that program too. And what are the key elements for success successful replicability of the project? The project can be used for any topic with the, with the apps uh, we, we have experimented. So uh, yesterday, during the, the workshop, uh, we talked about new ideas and how we could use it in primary cycle, but also uh, in the secondary cycle. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Florence. We are heading to the conclusion of the first session. Three more teachers to listen. Let's move on uh, to Yvonne Ingler-Betken. 
English as a foreign language to promote plurilingual and intercultural education. Please, Yvonne. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to um, report back from the workshop and the outcomes of English as a foreign language to promote plurilingual and multilingual education held by Margarita Guedekine and Leszek Kozlewa from the European School Luxembourg One. The mm, conductors of the workshop focus in an inductive and cooperative way of learning, way, way of learning and had a very um, strong focus towards the workshop participants. And from their inductive way of, uh, mm, of learning, uh, um, it became to us very clear what is plurilingual and intercultural learning. And I guess the colleagues um, would agree that the atmosphere was very co cooperative, communicative, and professional. So what did we do? We kicked off um, with um, a snappy intro, which was the icebreaker, and we had to present an unknown person to us. Everyone had to write their birthplace in their mother tongue, a meaningful phrase or word in their mother tongue, and an interesting thing about themselves in English. And this experience created a good platform for the next activity, with which was reporting an incident. And it was a role play. We were divided in groups of three, two travelers and one police officer. And um, the situation was that the traveler understood um, and the travelers understood but couldn't speak English, while the police officer um, doesn't speak or understand their languages but English. And uh, the task was to um, file an incident report using um, yeah, two different languages and uh, the, the body language. So here you can see uh, some pictures of this activity. Yeah, and, and through, this, um, through these activities, it became clear what is plurilingual in an in inductive way. It became clear what is pl plurilingual learning. It is the capacity to successfully acquire and use different competences in different languages at different levels of proficiency and different functions. And intercultural learning is a combination of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors, which allow the speaker to recognize um, understand and accept other ways of living and thinking beyond their home culture. And this competence is the basic of understanding among people and it's not limited to any language ability. The impact of the activity is the development of the pupils' knowledge regarding plurilingual and um, intercultural learning as well of the, as the um, key competences it also addressed the, di addressed the different needs of students. The proposed activities are easily to adapt to every language class and are very inclusive. Um, they can be enhanced with further activities foreseen in the curriculum of L2 and L3. Regarding the European dimension of the workshop, the proposed activities support the development uh, of the key competences in languages, literacy, cultural awareness and expression, civic and social learning. The outcome is the creation of a platform for sharing and exchanging the teaching resources. And if you are interested in this cooperation, please write to the holder um, of the workshop, Margarita, if you haven't done so yet. And I would like to 
uh, finish my presentation with a quote of the Austrian philosopher Ludwig um, Wittgenstein, who summarized the main spirit of this workshop. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Next one is Kimberly Ward reporting uh, about biodiversity and pollinating insects. Good morning, everybody. My report is based on the European School of Brussels One. The topic was sustainable development and the title of the project, Biodiversity and Pollinating Insects. The names of my new friends who conducted the project were Amelia. Can you give me a wave, Amelia, so I can... Oh, Amelia, hello. <laughs> and Marie. Marie? So they were very, very, very good. The pupils it was targeted at were P3 Italian and Danish students, approximately 60. But they hope that it continues to, to spread throughout the school from the materna to the secondary. The workshop Biodiversity and Pollinating Insects was a hive of activity in which the participants were buzzing with excitement and humming with enthusiasm. The Queen Bees, Amelia Marie, won our hearts instantly by inviting us to try the product at the centre of their project, Honey. From here, we then embarked on a sensory journey of approximately one and a half hours. Um, the expected outcomes for the children were predominantly from the P3 um, discovery of the world topic linked to biology. However, as Caro Fernandez, Ms. Caro Fernandez said, um, it could be then integrated across all curriculum areas, mathematics, languages, music, etc. So those were some of the proposed um, learning outcomes. It included a range of activities. Um, the children were going to have already met a beekeep beekeeper and observe the bees directly. They have created identity cards, educational posters. They have been tasting products. They made candles out of the bees' wax. They have been trying to find ways how to fund this project. And the end goal will be a um, self-maintained flowering oasis for pollinating insects. And here are some of the photos of the products. I was going to ask Marie to sing her, her verse. Marie, are we, are we there, Marie, or no? Not today. Marie? Not today. Okay. Maybe during the break you can ask her because she's got a beautiful voice. And, um, oh, do you want to? It will take 30 seconds. Don't worry. I know you need to go to the bathroom. But, Marie, are you ready? Susan? Okay. I think we'll give them a clap because it's quite scary. <laughs> So this is an example of integrating music into the, um, to the science aspect. Marie. Susan, your turn. Thank you, Alicante, and thank you, Brussels. <laughs> so the most innovative innovations of this proposed topic is, no offense to the AI um, reporters, but to not forget about the human element of teaching and learning. Students need to see, feel, touch, hear, and even taste what we are teaching them. We need to go beyond the screen, returning to the basics of experiencing the world firsthand in order to really engage and reconnect with our students. As teachers, we need to let go of control and not be so rigid with our planning, but to scaffold and guide the students and let them take the reins when it comes to the lesson planning, as this will ensure full engagement and motivation and dive deep into inquiry-based learning approach. Breaking free from the confines of the classroom and utilizing all the space and areas accessible 
rebuilding community by utilizing the experts or human resources that we have, for example, the school gardener or caretaker. What are the remarkable teaching methodologies? Um, the classroom will be used for theory. The computers will be dedicated to research. The art room will be the place to create posters and various objects. And the outdoor workshop will be a place where students will be able to share their knowledge and experience. This project sees the students live the curriculum from a 360 degree perspective. The European dimensions, the project touches on several of the 2030 sustainable development goals from which the European Union has committed to ensuring. It sees that students not only take ownership of their learning today, but also for their future. What are the lessons that we learned? In this project, students are particularly active. They are part of the process from the planning to the implementation. They identify the problem and it's their job to find the solutions. Um, how does it cater for differentiation? Due to the multi-central nature of the project, it can be pitched at students of different ages, catering for all learning styles. Each student plays a role and gives them the opportunity to feel important within the group as it offers each individual the chance to display their strengths and pass them on to their peers. Now my last slide, what do you need to replicate this? You need the authorization from the director and we had some very, very nice news that um, once this project was um, approved, Brussels one told me that their director said, okay, now it looks like a pretty good, good project. I'll give you a piece of land to do your garden. So that's very nice. You need collaboration of colleagues because it's an um, interdisciplinary project. You need passion and creativity. And you, of course, you need money. And on that note, please do not consider this corrupt in any way. But Mr. Beckman, we have got a gift for you from, from <laughs> Alicante, Brussels and Parma. Um, and we made it yesterday in the workshop using the products of the bee. <laughs> Your very own candle. Thank you very much, Kimberly, and thank you to your colleague for your beautiful little concert. And <laughs> the last, last one to speak is uh, Matthias van den Ede. Are you going to sing as well? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's reporting on Project Climate Council reduced the climate footprint of your school in eight months. Please. I'll start by ans uh, answering your questions, probably. Uh, yes, I am the last one in the row, and yes, I will make sure that we can have your coffee break in time. You have four minutes No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stay on your five minutes, don't worry. <laughs> um, so I had the pleasure to be yesterday um, on the workshop on sustainability and on how to reduce um, climate footprint. Uh, it's a project from Munich. And there were two wonderful colleagues, um, Florbella Calado and Christophe Cono. And they had this project for students from S1 uh, all the way up until S7. Um, the main goal of their, of their workshop was to, to combine democracy and to find tangible, sustainable solutions to reduce climate footprint in the school and in the whole school approach. And, and the workshop was, was wonderful. Um, we had a professional overview of their project in Munich, and then we had a great discussions with, um, with small groups of the, um, the staff present in the different workshops, and we had a great reflection on how to uh, adapt the project and how to, uh, to make it work in the different schools. I'll come back to this later. So um, they said that the main thing to do um, if you want to make it work is First, to um, create a motivated group of staff and pupils, so people who want to be involved, train them uh, in after-school activities. They, uh, they would come together, would have conferences on very specific topics with specialists from, uh, from the school present, have debates about this, and then spread the word. So the students and teachers who were trained would then train other students to create um, a great platform of, of awareness. Um, and all of this in preparation for what is going to come up in Munich, a climate council, so a very um, democratic in, mm, 
one day for now, but it could become uh, something that comes back, they said, and then implement the council's um, recommendations. So how does that work in more detail? Um, first, they, they've set up a, a, this group of students and teachers, and they had to come up with their own name, so they, they invented the Sustainable Action for Environment Academy, and, and they gave themselves some targets, so they, they want to put some solar panels on the roof in Munich, they want to put greening on the roof, they have already managed to consume 5% less in electricity, paper and water. They have organized an amazing second-hand fashion show um, in the past. And, and then they created a survey for all students, um, to involve all students and to see what, um, what were the expectations from, um, from the school. And with this, they plan to create this climate council. And in preparation for this, they have gathered an awful lot of data on uh, energy, nutrition, mobility, procurement, and, and they're going to create proposals to this, um, to this council um, that they then, then can decide to implement. Um, what I found very innovative was the fact that um, they had to work with loads of stakeholders, both inside the school and outside the school. Definitely the, the democratic aspects so the participants of the council were randomly chosen from their uh, staff and, um, and student population, so they, they had to be involved. Um, the students get an awful lot of very detailed data uh, on CO2 production, and, and of course it involved mm -hmm. the whole uh, secondary school. As, as my colleague said before, some colleagues actually said before, it's, it's not always easy to find good examples of entrepreneurship and active in citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, so this, is, this was amazing. It's uh, very, very stimulating. And, uh, and you could just feel that, that it worked. Um, successful replicability of the project. Uh, so as I said before, we had uh, very long discussions about it. And loads of <coughs> teachers um, <coughs> came with great ideas and gave, <coughs> gave interesting comments. And so I've listed only a few of the ones that, that came up. Um, first, the one that I found most important one is not to use an apocalyptic approach, so not to be very too uh, doomy, but to make everything uh, more in a positive way, to give a clear time frame, to give enough time, compensations to the teachers involved, and also to make sure that the regional government would get involved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Okay, I think we can start again. First of all, a useful communication. Uh, you can find and download all the material from these two days of forum in the website of the European School of Parma. So, uh, the first important topic that I want to introduce in the second day of our forum concern uh, artificial intelligence. We will discuss about it with two big experts in the field. Professor Gino Roncaglia. Let's make an applause to Professor Gino Roncaglia. <laughs> and Dr. Kari Kivinen. Please come. Professor Gino Roncaglia is professor at the University of Roma Tre with courses on uh, digital humanities, uh, digital publishing, and uh, philosophy of information. He wrote more than 100 uh, scholarly books uh, and articles in uh, history of logic uh, and digital humanities. He is scientific consultant for the cultural and uh, educational division of the Italian State TV RAI my own, <laughs> and uh, is an honorary professor at the Villa Maria University in Argentina. So, Professor Roncaglia, could you please uh, explain the concept of uh, generative intelligence, particularly in the context of, of its development within artificial intelligence frameworks, please? Okay, <laughs> this is quite a hard question. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. But <laughs> I will try to give an idea but you should all... Okay. You should all know that it is uh, actually impossible, of course, to give a reasonable idea in a few minutes. Uh, what I think it's important to stress is the difference between generative AI, the new generative AI, and classical artificial intelligence. We started to work on artificial intelligence in the 
mid-50s of the last century. So it's a quite a long history already. And at the beginning, the idea was that uh, uh, intelligence, our intelligence, is mainly made up of our ability of reasoning and uh, speaking. So language and logic were considered as the main feature of our intelligence. And the idea was, okay, since our intelligence is mainly based on logic and language, uh, and uh, since logic and language, this was another idea, another paradigm of these early studies in artificial intelligence, language and logic are systems of rules. So we can try to explicitate the rules, give them to a computer, and we will have an intelligent computer. A computer capable of making reasoning and of sp uh, speaking a language. There was a lot of optimism at the beginning on this idea. Uh, Herbert Simon, a Nobel Prize, he was at the first meeting on artificial intelligence in Dartmouth in uh, uh, 1956. And uh, he said, okay, we are 15 to 20 years away from having intelligent computers. And of course, he was wrong. Uh, about 20 years later, Marvin Minsky, another of the main figures of this early age of artificial intelligence, said, okay, I am working on artificial intelligence uh, in from 20 years, and the only intelligent thing I was able to produce was my song. My computers are far from being intelligent. So this, uh, this idea of building up artificial intelligence top-down, starting from our ability of using languages and of using reason reasoning, um, didn't work. Um, the research of artificial intelligence went on, mainly on uh, more uh, uh, smaller fields, uh, computer that can play chess, a computer that can translate limited sets of very standardized language, a uh, computer that can uh, take a medical, uh, the results of a medical examination and propose a diagnosis, this kind of limited, weak AI. Nowadays, we are working on a completely different paradigm based on neural networks. At the beginning, neural networks was also considered as part of classical AI, and the idea was that let's, let's look how our, our brain works. It's made up of neurons, and at the beginning, the model, abstract model of neuron, was that of a little logical machine, deterministic, based on logical rules, and uh, they started to work on this kind of neural networks very early, um, and uh, at the beginning, uh, the results were, were uh, uh, very poor. Everything changed when we switched from logical models of neurons, deterministic, to probabilistic models, where the neuron is actually a sort of mathematical entity which works uh, on uh, statistical and probabilistic uh, reasoning, and uh, little by little, we were able to find out that through this kind of mathematical, probabilistic neurons, we can build systems which are able to discriminate. The first neural networks were discriminating. For instance, I can train a network with a lot of images of cats, labeled, this is a cat, a lot of images of dogs, labeled, this is a dog, and after a while, if I give a new image without label to the system, the system can discriminate, identify whether it is the image of a cat or of a dog. Those are discriminative neural networks. Since we were lucky with discriminative neural networks, we tried to produce generative neural networks. We train the networks with a lot of images of cats and dogs, but this time we don't give the network an image, we ask the network to produce an image of a cat or of a dog. And yes, we found out that 
properly trained, uh, those kind of neural networks are able to generate new content. Now, what is changing now is mainly connected with a development which is quite recent. In uh, uh, 2017, a group of Google researchers proposed an architecture, I won't enter in the details because it would be very hard, but an architecture for producing, uh, uh, generating language using transformers. This kind of networks are trained with a large quantity of text. There is a huge corpus of text which is used. The text is split in tokens, small words, cat, dog, are tokens, and uh, for each token, the system builds uh, a mathematical model of the token, a matrix of numbers, which express the way in which the token is used in the corpus. This is applied to all the tokens of the text of the corpus, and from this mathematical model, the system is able to produce one token after the other plausible answers to the questions, to the prompt uh, that is given by the user. It's important to stress that what is done here is not a sort of data retrieval. The corpus is not a database. The corpus is used to make a language model or a visual model or a sound model. But then the system generates new language. Uh, the corpus is just used to understand how to use the tokens, which kind of relationships there are between the different tokens. But then the model builds up in an original way, in a sense, because of course it's strongly influenced by the corpus, the biases in the corpus may influence the way in which the tokens are represented, so there are biases in what the system can produce, but it is something new. It's not copying, it's not a database retrieving information from a corpus. This, trying to be very, very <laughs> simple, is the basic difference between the good old-fashioned artificial intelligence uh, of the last century and new generative artificial intelligence. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I have another question, very <laughs> tough. I mean, uh, uh, in your views, what constitutes the fundamental difference between uh, natural intelligence as exhibited by humans and the artificial intelligence as engineered in the computational systems? This is also a very <laughs> difficult question, <laughs> mainly because we don't actually know very much about... Uh, there is a lot of wonderful work that has been done in the last centuries, in the last decades, on uh, neurosciences. So. Actually, we do know a lot about how our, how our brain works, but there are a lot of things that we do not know about our intelligence. It's enough to say that uh, the theories of mind, how our mind works, well, today there are still two main schools in the theory of minds. Uh, a reductionistic one, uh, the mind is a product of the biological brain, and the non-reductionistic one, uh, there is something more in the brain, in the mind, than what is in our biological brain. We still do not know. So in a way, our intelligence is a sort of black box. Those systems which use probability, statistics, uh, and we never know exactly what's going on inside the system, they are also, in a sense, black box. So it's very difficult to say what's the difference and what's similar between two black boxes. What we can say is that our neurons work in a more complicated way than the artificial one, uh, mathematical object in neural networks. Uh, because our neurons use electrical signals to, to, to um, move information between, uh, within the brain, but also use chemical signals so it's, it's, it's quite complicated. While uh, mathematical neurons just exchange mathematical information. So uh, our brain is somehow more complex, 
this is something that at the moment we are quite sure of. Uh, and there is also another important difference that I think at this moment, at this point, we can stress. Um, a generative intelligent system produces output only when it is required to produce an output. Our brain is always talking to itself. Uh, there is a sort of inner uh, colloquium, an inner discussion with ourselves, and this is something that at the moment uh, generative intelligence systems do not do. So if we are asking, for instance, uh, there is conscious, consciousness in uh, artificial intelligence systems, at the moment, no. But they are very good in imitating consciousness <laughs> something, sometimes. But at the moment, we are quite sure that there is not. Uh, concerning the future, it's almost impossible to, to give an answer, just because we do not know enough. It's clear that with generative artificial intelligence in the last seven, six, seven years, we have touched something which is surprising. The results we get are surprising. For the people working in research in this field, the results are su surprising. So probably there is something which is connected with the way our intelligence work, but they are still quite different, I would say. Thank you. And where do you see the trajectory of generative intelligence heading in terms of its potential impacts on creative industries, educational paradigms, and the broader spectrum of uh, human-computer interaction? Well, I, I would say that probably the most important thing is for a long time, we have been used to think about computers as something quite powerful. They are not just a tool. They are a powerful tools, and uh, Marshall McLuhan uh, uh, taught us that uh, tools shape the way in which we use them. They are never simply a tool. But anyhow, we were used to the idea that a computer is something we use, and uh, the creativity is ours. It's us who are the creative people. And the computer is our tool in helping our creativity, but it's more or less a tool. Now, generative artificial intelligence is uh, shaking those beliefs, because actually uh, we can produce content which is original, which is quite interesting, which sometimes is quite surprising. For instance, do we have aesthetic values in some of the products of uh, uh, image generating systems such as Midjourney or Dali? It's quite difficult to say, but among the things that are produced by generative AI, there are surely things that we would judge to be aesthetically interesting if they were produced by human being. So uh, there is a level of new creativity in those tools, and they question a lot of what we were uh, sure about concerning also our uh, activities, uh, the labor market. What is, uh, in this moment, uh, for instance, uh, translators. We used to say, we still can say at the moment that humans translator are better in understanding nuances of the language uh, compared to artificial translator systems. But the more we give a corpora of text with a lot of information, a lot of, the more those systems learn to understand somehow to replicate nuances in language. And I would say at the moment it's quite sure that in 10, 15, 20 years, we will have artificial intelligence translation systems which are just as capable as human translators, if not even better than human translators, because they have a huge amount on, of data and they can model all those nuances in language. So for a lot of creative uh, professions, there's gonna to be problems. Um, in the sense that, yes, we can uh, cooperate with uh, artificial intelligence systems, but uh, I'm, I think that in perspective, 
uh, it is not so obvious that we will be the only ones being creative. Of course, at the moment, there are also problems, hallucinations. Hallucinations are, in a way, a feature of artificial intelligence system. Why do they invent stuff? They can invent bibliography. They, be, they can invent a lot of, staff, of, of stuff uh, because they are not information retrieval systems. It's just because they do produce new language, new images, that they can produce language or images which are not um, coherent with the truth, with the factual truth. Uh, but it's, uh, in a way, it's, it's part of how they work. Probably in the future, we will have a strict collaboration between uh, artificial generative intelligence and retrieval systems. It's what is, what is called now retrieval augmented generation, generation of content by using artificial intelligence checked through the use of retrieval systems. And uh, in this way, some of the problems can be probably in the future, we can avoid some of the worst hallucination of those systems. There are biases, so there are problems, but those are systems which are uh, surprising in many ways. And what about your views about what will be the future of uh, the use of AI in schools and educational programs? Well, there are probably, uh, we have already seen, unfortunately I wasn't here yesterday and then couldn't take part in the uh, workshops uh, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence. I've seen that uh, you had two of the workshops which were connected with artificial intelligence. There are ways in which artificial intelligence, uh, generative artificial intelligence can be used in school. But I would say the most important thing is uh, what we call AI literacy. Uh, there has been a lot of work in the last years on the concept of information literacy. Schools should work in helping st their students to understand how information works, how the landscape of the use of information changed through digital technologies, to the internet, uh, through the use of social networks. Uh, so there is a lot of work that has to be done on how we produce, evaluate, select information. Today, the, a, an important part of this work is working on uh, artificial intelligence literacy, trying to explain how those systems work, what are their limitations, what are their features, which kind of reflection, because we also have ethical, philosophical issues, which are connected to the use of artificial intelligence. is a completely new field uh, from the point of view of the generative artificial intelligence, but one which will have such a huge impact on our lives that it is essential that schools do, hand, do work on AI literacy, do uh, include a, a component of activities and information and uh, competencies connected with the field of artificial intelligence. So I think this is the main and most important thing we have to do. So the final question is, uh, in terms of practical steps to, to, to take to integrate AI literacy into school uh, curriculum. Yes, uh, this is a bit of a challenge because um, with the evolving media landscape, we all, we all teach and we always have the impression that uh, we always have new things to teach while the curriculum is <laughs> that one <laughs> uh, with traditional uh, boundaries between different subjects. Uh, um, I think what we will have to do is to understand that a lot of those new competencies and new knowledges require working uh, outside the traditional boundaries of traditional curriculum. So we need more time and more places, even physical pla places, learning environments in which we can work with these new subjects. Um, I think that a very important uh, uh, place, a very important environment for working with these kind of topics 
is the school library. Because the school library, it, it used to be the place where to learn to, to read, to, to promote reading, uh, but the school library is actually the place where we can learn to go deep on different kind of subjects, even on subjects which are not in the traditional curriculum. So I think that a new conception of school library, which is not just devoted to books, but to different kinds of information. Books are still very, very important, but a school library in which we can work with different kinds of information is essential also for information literacy and uh, AI literacy. Then there is another problem that we should also be aware of. We used to think to, uh, about the school system or the university system as something which uh, is used to, f to build up new generations of uh, citizens. But we also have old generations of citizens, and by old I don't mean very, very old, of course there are also very, very old people, but I mean people uh, 25, 30, 40, 50 years old, who do not have the basic information which today are required to be competent, informed citizens. So I think that a very crucial point is to rethink our system of education uh, from one side, uh, computers, uh, even artificial intelligence, uh, may help in reducing our working time. But we have to substitute uh, to working time a new quota of learning time. We should think of an education system which doesn't look only, even if they are of obviously very, very important, to younger students. We should also work to the society as a whole, and I think that schools and universities should really, from this point of view, we need a, a radical change of attitude, and we need schools and universities that are able to speak also to older people, to us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Gino Roncaglia, for your very interesting argumentation. And now let's introduce uh, uh, PhD Dr. Kari Kivinen, the education outreach expert of the UP Observatory. He leads the intellectual property in education project and network which promotes creativity, innovation, and responsible digital engagement among young Europeans. He has over 30 years of work experience in teaching and management of international school in Finland, Luxembourg, and Belgium. Currently, he combines his work in the UPO with lecturing on digital information literacy, artificial intelligence. Dr. Kivinen, given your, can you see me? Yeah, I can move. <laughs> uh, given your extensive experience, could you please explain the importance of establishing a comprehensive AI policy within uh, educational systems? I switch on, please. Yeah. So, thanks for the question and thanks for the invitation here. I would like to first, before I give any answer, to congratulate the Italian presidency, the Board of Governors, for this absolutely mind-blowing experience to invite teachers for this forum. Uh, I have been in the European schools for 21 years, and this is the first time we are really concentrating on teachers. And what kind of teachers? <laughs> Um, so, in the project I, I lead, we are kind of promoting creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, and responsible digital engagement. What that have we seen this morning? Exactly that. You are doing wonderful work in the European schools. We have seen the use of AI in the lessons in different types, all kind of creative issues which are trying to solve the problems and link to the key competencies for lifelong learning. So now to answer to your question, uh, in the European Union, um, which I'm now representing, I'm working in EU IPO as a civil servant. There is life after European schools for all of you to know. <laughs> uh, we are absolutely working hard uh, with uh, digital competence, uh, with the digital skills, definition, 
uh, how to tackle disinformation in the online environment, uh, the ethics of AI, and European Union has uh, these five big regulations uh, coming up with the Digital Service Act is supporting and protecting children, for example, from a lot of things. So let's say that in the European Union we are doing a lot on, on, on these issues. And to be more concrete, uh, if you want to hear more about my project, which I'm not going to tell you more here, you can visit uh, our site. Uh, you can get information but afterwards. So what is important, uh, and I'm going to be very concrete uh, on the, and if I may, I go directly to response on certain issues raised. Information literacy is important. It's part of the media and information literacy. And um, if you go to any library in the world, and I agree, libraries are hugely important. It's important that children learn to read. The better they learn to read, the better they are able to resist uh, disinformation, the better they are dealing with the online uh, uh, artificial intelligence biases and, and, and hallucinations. So it's important uh, to uh, to know that this time we have a new situation. Everybody has in their pockets uh, all the information, digital information on the world. Children of seven, eight years old, they can find in Google or other search engines exactly the same things what adults can do. And the, the responsibility, it's not librarian or the writer of the book, it's given to each individual, each child. They are able to analyze, they are able to assess what kind of uh, information the search engines are giving to them. And in the schools, I think our task is to give students this kind of skills so that they can find the information which is matching the information needs. And mm, this is something hugely important and we call it digital information literacy, that to be able to find, to assess, uh, correct information inside of the vast uh, amount of information uh, given us by search engines. And now we have this generative AI. Instead of getting one million or two million or 100 million hits, like in search engines, we get one answer. And very often this one answer is not correct. And we need more digital information literacy than ever before. Our students, our pupils, they need to be able to verify if the information given by generative AI tools is correct or is it usable and how they can uh, go further by prompting and continuing prompting. We saw yesterday good examples of how, how to do it. So this kind of critical uh, online uh, literacy, uh, artificial literacy is needed more than ever before. Thank you, Kari. And could you please outline the current uh, limitation of artificial intelligence that stakeholders uh, should be aware of, uh, especially in contexts such as uh, intellectual property and uh, creativity? So, like we heard uh, <laughs> a few minutes ago, um, the artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence, uh, long lang l large language models have been trained with unbelievable amount of information. Let's see whole internet, everything which can be crawlable. And we know all what information is in the internet. There are a lot of correct information, but there is a lot of nonsense information, there is a lot of biased information, and there are also lacking information. And the large language models are depending on the quality of the data. So very often, and the first we, uh, we heard already about the, uh, the hallucinations and uh, disinformation or not correct information given by these tools. They have to be always verified. And this is something uh, I would like to underline that please teachers, teach students when they are using artificial intelligence tools, never to share straight away what they are getting. They have to be checked. It has to be, uh, for example, sourcing. It's just such an important thing, and uh, many artificial intelligence tools, they don't give sourcing. And if they give, they might be wrong. So they have to be checked. So 
The next thing which we don't talk of much is that artificial intelligence services are having age limit. Most of them are K-13. Why is that? Because they know themselves that they are giving sometimes biased uh, information. And so when you are using artificial intelligence tools with little children, uh, it has to be teacher-driven activity. Uh, and you can read the instructions from the artificial intelligence sites which uh, proposing that. Um, from, the, from the intellectual property <laughs> point of view, there is uh, two little problems, input and output. The input is that the generative AI tools have been trained by copyright protected material. And there is not yet a kind of agreement, with, for example, bit between the big publishing houses and uh, media houses on how the compensations of uh, using their materials would be done. And very recently, last summer, uh, there is this new opt-out possibility, which is giving more worries. 80% of the US media houses, quality media houses, are now saying that artificial intelligence cannot use their material. And the ones who are left are right-wing or extremist uh, sources. In Europe, it's about 47%. And what is important for you to know that every prompt you make in the generative AI, it's used for uh, training the, 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 the whole system. And therefore, no confidential information, no name of the children, no addresses, no nothing which is uh, uh, confidential can be put inside. But yet, it's absolutely wonderful tools. And I don't want to give a pessimistic. There are limitations. And when we know limitations, and when we are using in the critical way, uh, it can help teachers work in many ways. That is actually my next question. In your opinion, how AI can be effectively applied within school environments to enhance uh, educational outcomes to prepare students for a future where AI plays a significant role? It has already been mentioned that uh, artificial intelligence are providing, for example, excellent tools for translations. In the European schools, when I was working there, I, I really hoped that I would have had artificial intelligence because it, it would have helped uh, sometimes parents even in schools happenings uh, to create materials, uh, information in several languages. And they are developing really fast. They are quite reliable. I use myself DeepL com and it, it's it's quite excellent but the we saw yesterday and I have to make now a distinction between the old traditional artificial intelligence which is used by a lot of um, uh, kind of sites we saw this geographical uh, AI session yesterday and there are a lot of for example Eurostat if you go there you can have ma interactive maps you go to uh, different sites where the artificial intelligence, the traditional artificial intelligence is kind of animating, creating a uh, lot of illustrations which is helping students to understand what you are trying to tell. And for the teacher's work, um, it can be a tool. The problem is that when I was in Finland, which is supposed to be one of the top ranking countries in media literacy, and uh, I met about 800 teachers I know because we took their email addresses uh, for the, the correspondence. About 10% of them, they say that I use I, uh, generative AI in my work in the school. About 30-40% say that I do it at home. And uh, I'm not yet feeling that I'm able to go with, uh, with in the classroom. And about 60% say that I heard about it. I'm curious, but I have not yet kind of found a way how to touch it. And now comes the recommendation. 80 or 90 percent of your students are using artificial intelligence tools. <laughs> you are absolutely, it's necessary for you to start playing, testing at home, looking how it works, to find out what you can do. And you, can, you will find out that you can do wonderful resumes, you can organize nice exams, you can do all kind of things. You can adapt the difficult text for the, um, to the child in your class who is having weaker language skills. You can just give a prompt that please adapt this text to the level of A2 or B1. 
or whatever. So artificial intelligence is a wonderful tool for the teachers of the European schools. And you should really learn to use it. But be careful, because there are these uh, limitations. <laughs> yes. Uh, if I may add something, it is also important to know that there isn't just chat GPT. There is also Claude, there is also Mistral. So it is good to try different systems to check which one works better for a given task. Uh, this is also, I think, something which can be suggested to, to teachers. And currently, which one is the best? <laughs> they are quite different. <laughs> Mistral is a European model, a French mm. model, actually. And it's uh, quite, it's better on European culture, somehow. And it's also quite interesting from a technical point of view, but it's a good idea to experiment also with Mistral. Uh, Claude, uh, Claude 3 is on the level of ChatGPT4, but sometimes they give different kinds of answers. So it's good to try a little bit of uh, all of them, I would say. Thank you. Yes, Gary. I would recommend, um, for example, per per perplexity.ai. Um, it's, it tries to give you the sources. It's not always correct, but it does its best. And there is a new one uh, just launched. Uh, it's very user-friendly, and it tries to eliminate hu uh, 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 the human contact. It's called pi.ai. Uh, it's very beautiful, very nice, and it's very polite. So, but there are different tools. For the images, one thing I forgot to mention is that at this moment in the AOEPO, we are dealing with intellectual property uh, uh, things. Um, we have this uh, kind of global information that only human products can be copyright protected. So if you are creating something with, uh, um, with uh, image generative tools, there are many, I use a lot, Ping, uh, create.ping.com, um, it has no copyright protection. It means that you can use it freely in the PowerPoints without being afraid that you are uh, violating somebody's copyright. So um, there are so many things you can do with artificial intelligence tools, and there are so many. Every, every week there are tens and tens of new applications coming into that. You can do PowerPoints, you can do now even uh, videos, you can do whatsoever, but be careful. That's the, that's the thing to say. Thank you. Thank you very much to Kari Kivinen for your exhaustive clarification you have provided regarding this complex topic. Thank you also again to Professor Gino Roncaglia. We would listen uh, to you for hours, <laughs> but we have to go on with uh, our schedule. Thank you very much. Okay, now I would like to invite the participant of the next panel entitled Enhancing Teacher Career in the European School System, which are Andreas Beckman, European School System Secretary General. <laughs> you can find a place where you want. Katarina Djurjek, is it correct? Yes. <laughs> European School Inspector, Secondary Cycle. <laughs> Dimitri Estaves Gonsalves, uh, accredited European School teacher. Mayor Martin, teacher for European School Brussels One. Anton Robert, director for, of uh, European School in Munich. <laughs> Triaza Kirk, head of Irish delegation of European School and Roberta, <laughs> Roberta Fantinato, Director of Accredited European School of Parma. Okay, uh, do you have, I hold this place for everybody, yes, okay. It's a beautiful table. Okay, we are gonna share the microphone for the answers. And I would like to ask two questions to both, to, to, to everybody. And uh, starting with Andreas Beckman, European School System Secretary General. I, would you define a teacher's career in general and in the European school in particular? Thank yeah. you. Uh, no. oh, there might be another one. It's one. Lars and I'm 
must switch off one of them. <laughs> now it should, it should work. Okay, just one, okay. okay. Yeah, thank you very much for, for inviting us to this panel discussion and I'm, I'm also grateful to have all the colleagues and the different perspectives with us because um, it's really the individual view on, on, on your question how to define a teacher's career in general and in the European school system. Actually, I'm not so sure if there's really a difference between teacher's career in general and here in the European school system. I have to admit that uh, I had a little bit of problem with the word teacher's career because for me it's all about professional development, to develop for further as a person but as also as a professional. Develop your skills, get new experiences. And um, therefore I think when we are looking to the European schools, we have different possibilities to further develop. And development does not necessarily mean, for me at least, that you have um, a vertical development having a career with certain steps. You may say, no, he's joking because he's a secretary general, he can easily say that, but um, I can share also with you from my professional life, there were moments where like uh, Mr. Cinini said the other day, uh, yesterday, I had to leave my comfort zone. Not necessarily to progress further, but to do a step aside and then maybe f later on progressing. And I think this is essential that we are, like today, in a, f a moment where we learn from each other, where we, mm, this does not directly uh, translate in any kind of career steps. But we learn something, we getting new horizons, and I think this is the most important. Now, coming to the European school system, what we have to promote is, first of all, this, let's say, on a horizontal level, progression. And what can we do? Teachers Forum is an excellent example. We learn from each other. We should promote furthermore training develop a training policy, and this brings us also very much um, to the Parliament's report. Open, be open for mobility among teachers. Let them grow, um, teach each other, learn from each other. Yes, and we have also the possibility to further grow from a career perspective within the European schools, and it is true that the system as such is a little bit limited because we have the teacher functions, we have the assistant deputy directors and the directors, maybe a function in the office. Um, I think we should be more uh, flexible. I think, oh, by the way, we also need, and this is again something stemming from the Parliament's report, we need by far more middle management functions. If this is always linked to higher salary or not, it's a different question. And I think we will listen later to Anton Horvat, where they have an excellent example how they deal with that in, in the school in, in, in Munich. And for sure, for me, part of career within the European school system is also not be limited either in the bubble of the traditional schools or the bubble of the accredited European schools, but to have this flexibility and mobility between the two types of schools and having also the mobility between the system of European schools and the national system. Entering into the system, but then also going back to the national system with the experiences you have gained, and maybe coming back at a certain moment again to the European schools, either in the accredited European schools or in the traditional schools. Uh, thank you, and where do you see areas of improvement and uh, where possible limitation and uh, who are the different actors in charge of promoting teachers' career? Yeah, I think the, the um, limitations, and I speak mainly from the perspective of the traditional schools, because there we have a homogeneous um, staff frame, legal frame for the staff. When we're talking about the accredited European schools, they are national schools, so they have the national system um, w and the national rules which are applicable. Um, so let me start with the traditional schools. And you know we have, when we are talking about teachers, we have seconded teachers and locally recruited teachers. I know, and Myra is with us, that you may say the nine years rule for secondment is a limitation. Because it means that after nine years as a teacher, you will have to leave the system unless you find another function. Honestly, I don't think that this is really a limitation. 
because nine years in the same position, even if you would have some, some mobility between the schools, is quite a lot. Myself, I've grown up in a ministry where we had to change every three years. And I think this also very much helps. I'm not promoting three years of secondment. Don't, <laughs> don't take me wrong. And I, in particular, uh, as we are in, in, uh, hosted in Italy, and we know we have uh, uh, currently a limitation when it's secondment. So I'm not promoting that. But I would not think that the nine years as such as are a limitation. It, I think it is even some kind of incentive to further grow and to look for, for alternatives and, as I said, coming back. Where I see limitations and where I see also some kind of, yeah, of real weakness is, for example, the question of locally recruited teachers and their recognition. <laughs> and uh, we will discuss this in the Board of Governors again, because you must just know, they enter the system, no matter what is the experience, they can have been seconded teachers before in the system, they have might have been in an accredited European school, they might have even had a management, middle management function in the national system, they, stay, they start as step one. And this is something we have really urgently to overcome. Um, th I think the second part was on the actors. And when it comes to career, or let's say professional development, the main actor is for and foremost the teacher himself, herself. Because there is an important responsibility of each of us if we want to further develop, if we want to uh, you, uh, sorry, leave our comfort zone, if we want to grow and learn more, first thing. Second thing, and I think this has been highlighted also very much in a training we had quite recently for managers of the schools, the managers in the schools. And I'm not only referring to myself or the directors or deputy directors, also middle management, they have a role, they have to promote their staff, they have to be the coaches of the teachers. And I think this is something which is time consuming and which we should also reflect in their job description. And then we have two other actors, and then I, I finish. Um, there is a role of the Office of the Secretary General for the European Schools as such. We have to provide, uh, with the support of the Board of Governors, uh, a plan for professional de development. We have to promote uh, events like today. But I think it's also very important to make the European schools more visible. Because if we are visible and recognized in the European educational area, this means we are attractive. Teachers then are interested to join the system. And when leaving the system, they will be also recognized back home. And this leads me to the fourth actor. And here I'm talking about the seconded teachers. The member states seconding the teachers. They have to support the teachers before entering our system, but also when they are coming back. The nine years in the European schools or wherever should not be seen as holidays somewhere abroad. It should be seen as a real professional step forward. And this means also that this time is recognized, and this is maybe, for example, uh, uh, an item of qualification for further management positions in the national system. So four actors, first and foremost the teachers, secondly their managers, the office, so me and my colleagues, and the seconding men, member state. These are for me the main actors, and probably I've forgotten one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Andreas Beckman. Now I'd like to turn to Dimitri Esteves Gonzalez, accredited European school teacher of the European School of Luxembourg One. Um, no. Uh, you and Insta. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen, Dimitri, what kind of opportunities can be provided to support teachers in their continuous professional development and career? Well, actually, I think my answer will echo Mr. Beckman's previous answer. Uh, first of all, uh, for me here, this is very important because it marks the 10-year anniversary of me being in the European school system. And in 10 years, uh, I wouldn't have believed everything that I've done. When it comes to career, I have this one philosophy. It's that career is like life. It's what you make it. In, in terms of opportunities that can be offered, I think there are two types. One that could be external to the school first, 
They can be trainings, uh, subject trainings, for instance. And the other, a little bit more free, I would say online courses. I'm currently pursuing another master's degree right now. Uh, and all this with the support of my, um, of my school. The other is, I would say, more internal to the school. And this has been really interesting for me because over the, these 10 years, I've been able to participate in what I would call extracurricular activities, uh, like the timetables, being a coordinator for several subjects, or even very recently to participate in budget meetings. All this, I think, it enables to enhance your personal skills, which go beyond teaching. And it offers a, a better understanding of how a school works. Uh, yes, uh, about the skills, uh, Dimitri. Which skills do teachers need for enhancing the attractiveness of the European school system? I would say there are mainly three skills that I could summarize. The, the first one is, uh, they kind of go together, so open-mindedness uh, to all the cultures and a thirst for knowledge, hence the opportunities that we mentioned before. And, and to illustrate this, I, <laughs> I would like to uh, go back to how I entered the system uh, 10 years ago. Um, so, obviously, I had a job interview uh, with uh, the European School of Frankfurt. And uh, as any job interview goes, you have that one question, why would we hire you to a European school? And my answer was, well, let's see. I was born in France. As you can see, my first name is either Greek or Slavic. My last name is Portuguese. My mother is Spanish. I was raised in Andorra. My current master is done in Italy, and to fund this, I spent summers working in England. <laughs> <laughs> no, but with this, what I would like to say is, so this open-mindedness, it also comes from management, because it takes two to tango. The, um, you, you should have also a direction who will take a chance on you. And in 10 years, I don't think there's ever a moment where I don't, real, I don't thank the director who hired me 10 years ago. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Oh, and so that was the first one, <laughs> sorry. The, the second would be social skills. Um, we have this saying that no one arrives at a European school by accident. We all have interesting backgrounds and wonderful stories. And with this, you can create a, a great network. To this day, again, after 10 years, I've made enduring friendships, uh, people I, I get to see every now and then, and actually teachers and directors alike. The th third now, uh, and I think it will be the most important, is flexibility, because it goes with this open-mindedness and thirst for knowledge I mentioned, but also in parallel with a, um, a desire to be part of the school and part of the system. When it comes to flexibility, I could mention that in 10 years, I've taught nine different subjects in the system, and I'm very happy about it. <laughs> Um, and for this, again, I, I can only thank the three schools I work with, so Frankfurt, Tallinn, and Jünglinster, who not only took a, a chance on me on my profile, but also empowered me to, to become the teacher I am today. And to finish on, on this note, because we've been talking about AI and everything, so in a world that insists on changing, I think one constant is that a teacher should be an inspiration. Many thanks, Dimitri.
And now I'm coming to Roberta, Roberta Fantinato. It's your turn. <laughs> Director of Credit European School of Parma. Uh, Roberta, what kind of uh, innovative initiatives or measures uh, can we put in place uh, to support teacher development and career progression? My point of view is different because I'm an Italian school principal and I'm appointed here for three years. So I come from the Italian system and go back, will go back to the Italian system. In both th system, I observed that um, we have got to, to ensure that the teachers and school lead the changes rather than simply undergo them. And so um, I think that we have got to prepare better the teachers and the school to lead the changes. There is a beautiful book uh, by Paul Dix, uh, whose title is When the Teachers Change, Everything Changes. And I think that uh, this is the essence uh, of our school. And so first of all, I would offer a really quality learning time to all teachers. What is interesting, and I am talking to Italian colleagues, is that in the European school system, uh, in training service is compulsory, while in the Italian system it isn't. So it's very difficult for Italian teachers. It's hard to go out from the comfort zone and to, to have time, to take time to learn. And so uh, I ask myself, how can teachers learn in a good way if they don't know, for example, how uh, our brain is working, how digital, uh, all the digital tools changed our way of learning? Why don't they study neuroscience? Why do they, they don't take care of what AI is uh, taking into our life? But while in the European system it's more simple because you tell the teacher you've got this training and they've got to do this training in the Italian system, it's impossible. And so this uh, is uh, a problem, it's a great problem. And uh, moreover, I think, and this in both system, that um, leadership preparation is essential because, because when you start uh, a different role, your point of view changes. And so you've got to be prepared to play this role. And so I think that specialized training and mentorship for leadership and middle management, which is very rich in European system and a bit different in the Italian system, could be very important because you have a very good staff that can lead the school. And it's uh, very important. And then, Mm, last but not least, uh, I think that uh, um, we have all uh, got to, uh, to work on the work environment. Uh, uh, it's very, very important to have an environment uh, centered on collaboration, innovation, professional growth. In these two days, we are all very happy because uh, we are enthusiastic and there is a beautiful atmosphere and we can feel passion but it's not always like that, and we all know that then we go back to school, we are tired, and uh, uh, there are conflicts, it's more difficult. And so it's very important, in my opinion, to work uh, on the school climate, because I think that if teachers are well and the climate is good, also in classes uh, and uh, with the pupils, which are our core business, of course, uh, we all work better. Thank you, Roberta. And <laughs> What about this, the right strategy to bolster the professional growth of teaching staff in uh, alignment with the European school's ethos and standards? Uh, I invited uh, and we decided to invite Professor Roncalli and Kari Kivinen because first of all, I think that uh, Italian school, but especially and also European school system, um, should start working on an AI curriculum, syllabus, for the pupils and for the teachers. I think that we cannot wait anymore about this. In China, in primary schools, they have AI curriculum. What are we waiting? So I think that for European school system is more simple because you have 
many, many very good experts, and then the system is smaller, and so it's easier to have, mm, to have a syllabus. For Italian uh, system, it's much more difficult, but I think that we have got to educate our teacher about AI, to incorporate AI into teaching methodologies and to help pupils to work uh, with AI because uh, we have got to prepare them for future challenges. Uh, for example, in our school, uh, we uh, organized a sort of a group uh, of teachers who are interested in AI and uh, who read books and who had courses. And then we'll try to work together and to see how to train the other colleagues and how to work in classes. And so we, ca we started with the more passionate, the more, the more interesting, and we see if they can uh, be leader for the other uh, teachers. And then I loved your idea, Andreas, of a sort of um, mobility for teachers. And I think uh, an Erasmus for, for national and European school system teachers. It would be very, very interesting because uh, um, these school, uh, the European school, are a sort of a bit closed, not, all, not uh, always well known. I, I saw if during these three years in Parma, I started talking to the colleagues, inviting the colleagues, inviting the teacher, and I thank you because many colleagues and many teachers coming from this region, from Parma here, and they started appreciating and working together. For example, they started thinking about uh, the assessment of European school and see if you can bring uh, these tools uh, for the assessment uh, in the Italian school. And so I think that it would be really very, very interesting to have this sort of Erasmus exchanges so that educators from different uh, systems can share experience, ideas, and best practices. Because I think that it could uh, really enrich uh, the, the system, the national system and the European system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta. Two questions now for Katrina Djurjek. It's correct, sort of. <laughs> okay. European School Inspector Nursery and Primary. So I'm going to call you Katrina, it's easy. Okay. <laughs> How can we connect continuous professional development and well being of teachers and pupils? Can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for being here and for being invited for this first teacher's forum. And I do hope that this is not just one, that we will continue it every year. Mr. Secretary General also mentioned that this is a good uh, example of exchange of best practice. And I do have to warn you that I used to be a teacher. So my mindset is around 45 minutes of interaction. So you will just stop me when, when, when you see that the audience is not uh, attentive. Okay, thank you very much for the question. It's very simple. So we just provide very interesting, regular, continuous professional development to our teachers. They feel comfortable in their shoes. They, they feel comfortable in the classrooms. They deliver interesting teaching. They engage their students. The students have excellent learning outcomes. They become excellent uh, citizens. They go to universities, and basically that's it. But then the small questions come. How? When? Why? Who? And there is this li little question, how much? <laughs> and I leave it to you to think what I mean by how much. So, but I will go backwards. So, well-being of students. You all know that we have a nice policy on well -being, pupils' well-being framework, which has been adopted luckily in my country, in Dubrovnik, two years ago. So we really take care of our students. We are there for the students in the classrooms. We, we would like to teach them new things, how to behave, how to become excellent citizens. We want to have safe environment for our students. And the teachers. Who thinks about the teachers? We actually take you for granted. So you are excellent people. You are experts in your profession. You know your subject. And nobody thinks that this is actually one of the most stressful professions. 
I'm doing my PhD, and so I, I, I researched a bit teachers, and my PhD thesis will be on the satisfaction of teachers with professional development. So I see how, where I will go. But I was surprised. Yesterday we, we heard about how many pupils are actually being violated or endangered, so to say. I don't know how many of you knew, but one in four teachers is actually under a lot of stress and tending to leave the profession. Majority stays. Why? We are enthusiastic, we are passionate about teaching, we love our students and we love what we do. But we do need the support and I'm really happy that the, the director mentioned this initiative at the school level. So we need this whole school approach that was mentioned yesterday. Because yes, the management is there, we have middle management. We have a lot of people in the school, but nobody takes care of the teachers themselves. Yes, we say, you are excellent, the inspectors will do the training, but we never speak about the importance of this intrinsic motivation for professional development. Everybody does it. We have just heard, you need to introduce artificial intelligence. Great. Do you feel comfortable in your class with your students to teach them how to use it when you are not comfortable in it? I don't think so. But if you had a training, if you had nice workshops as we have just had yesterday, if you see what your colleagues do and you really do great things. I really enjoyed yesterday, I really enjoyed uh, visiting the schools. And you know what it's important, and there I will turn to the management, but also on this side. I think we all forget to say, Thank you to the teachers. You do a great job. I liked this way how you organized the workshop. <laughs> you know, sometimes we forget about little things. Just saying thank you, praise the activity. We like to get feedback. So I like to see that Secretary General is smiling, so I'm speaking <laughs> right away. But you know, there is the other thing as well. The teachers, every single day, go into the classroom. Every 45 minutes or half an hour, you get a new group of students. Sometimes you're in an excellent mood, but sometimes you have difficulties at home. You have issues with your own children. You don't know how to deal with some, time, uh, some things. But at the same time, those 20 students are waiting for you to be smiling, to do the cheerful activities, engagement, uh, engaging activities, and nobody gives you any support. So this is where I see that professional development needs to step in. It's, I would say it's easier to help the teachers to develop in their subject matter. But how to deal with a group of very different students? How to get them all engaged? Do you ever get a feedback from your director, assistant, deputy, colleague? Do you have time? And it's not actually, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to have a look, okay? I'm just scared. But and it's the last question, how much that you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, my point is, the teachers are always asked to do some things in the classroom. And they say, I have syllabus, I don't have time. But they make the time. So the point is, the management, we have to also make the time to take care of the students, uh, of the teachers. If you feel well in your shoes, you will never leave the school. You will never leave your colleagues. You will cooperate. You will exchange uh, information. I speak out of my personal experience. When I started teaching, and that was quite some time ago. I was scared. I didn't know anybody. I entered the school. And, you know, they just told me, oh, you teach on the first floor. I was lost. After a while, I was so stressed that my family asked me to quit. But I said, no, no, no. What I did, I looked for another school, and I went to the other school. My main point is there are small things that we all can do because I know that we work for the salary. 
but it's not number one. And this is what the research has shown. So it's not that I speak out of my experience. So research has shown that salary and equipment and everything else, it's quite lower. It's basically what you feel and how you feel in the classroom. And the problem is if we run away in the classroom, close the door and we feel happy, but when we open the classroom and we don't feel the school atmosphere, this whole school approach, then there is a problem. And there I go to the attractiveness also. The best promoters are you as teachers. If you take part in Erasmus, if you take part in e-training, you meet other colleagues. And now when you are seconded, why wouldn't you do the training for your colleagues back at home? My seconded teachers do it. And it's great experience back at home in Croatia. Well, just a few people know about the European school system. It's great, it's unique, it's special, but it's limited limited uh, a community that is aware of. So professional development is of huge importance. And I believe that the structures, so the, the, the office, the management need to make a vision, need to make a framework for, uh, for the professional development of teachers. And I think it's extremely important what we have just heard now in School of Parma, the school needs to have a vision. So if you know what kind of training the school needs, what kind of training the teachers need, then you all know where to go. And the most important thing is basically when you do the training, share it with your colleagues. And there the management has also a huge role because they need to make it possible for the teachers to share. All of you are very enthusiastic. But back at home at schools, not all of you are or not all of us are too enthusiastic. So we need to promote best examples. We need to give excellent uh, examples of teaching. And then the others will pick up as well. And now I could continue for another 25 minutes, but I think no, I should no, stop I here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's OK. Thank you very much, Catherine. <laughs> I, I think you, you have done everything, question and answer. So it's, uh, you already answered all my questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. Let's speak with uh, Anton Robert, uh, Robert, director of European School of Munich. Um, how can second teachers and uh, those hired locally within the school system grow over the years, uh, taking on different tasks like uh, coordinators, middle managers, coaches, trainers? Well, um, some of you might already know my mantra which comes from a favorite author who wrote the book, if you don't feed the teachers, they eat the students. <laughs> and well, before you prepare now the dishes, um, it is necessary to know um, what kind of appetite the different teachers might have for the first dish, for the main course and for the dessert. I would say for the first dish, this is reserved for those who are in their, let's call it survival stage. So the new teachers, one, two, three, four, six years teaching practice. The main dish is reserved for those who are in their mastery stage and the dessert is for those who are in the routine stage. But I would say that within these different dish dishes, you have differences. Because it could be that a teacher who, after, let's see, a time of con, uh, con, con when he, when he uh, passes the, 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 the first stage, enters um, uh, a time when he or she develops as a active experimenting teachers, teacher and maybe then be a so-called master teacher. Patious, very super uh, superstar, I would call. But it could also be that there is uh, maybe the, the danger that um, you start to be, uh, have a self, to be self-doubtness and to um, maybe go into kind of a conservatism and at the end, 
be very frustrating. So now as a cook, um, you enter now the kitchen of a European school and look for the food, the ingredients and the tools. And I think there are some there and you have to be creative and we have heard lots of examples how to motivate um, the different kinds of uh, teachers. And I would say that like in Munich, we have um, established since years this uh, middle management structure, which gives uh, uh, teachers who are, let's see, very much engaged, active, who want to succeed, the possibility to take over responsibility within different areas. But it gives also the chance to those who might struggle a little bit that they get support from those, from the middle managers, but also from the coordinators, uh, and maybe then uh, keep on going. Um, so that you have always this kind of exchange. And I would suggest that this is the most important thing in a European school. And I said that in previous times, that the <laughs> working in a European school is a treasury of, of these opportunities to exchange, to learn, from the different kinds of uh, yeah, colleagues with the different kinds of educational background and so on. And so I can only encourage the exchange, exchange, exchange. Uh, thank you, Anton. And how can European school, I mean, traditional and accredited, can, how can cooperate uh, in order to enhance a new idea of uh, internal in-service training? Well, as already mentioned, there are limitations, and uh, these limitations are, um, well, given by the system. Sometimes it's a financial limitation, but you can be also very creative and uh, <laughs> check what you, you, you find in your kitchen. And one would be to uh, enhance uh, school internal in-service trainings. We started during the COVID crisis to build up a, yeah, a platform where the teachers, uh, well, those, let's call them the, the master teachers, and gave some, some examples how to use the, or to adapt the methods of teaching using uh, teams and so on, for example. And we, 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 we invited also other schools and they participated. And this is also, I would say, a dream of myself. And maybe <laughs> it could be a result after this uh, wonderful occasion that you form the two, three or four schools form a partnership, um, ideally a traditional school with two accredited schools or three, and then exchange, exchange um, the expertise, set up a kind of an yeah, uh, in-service training online or even visit uh, personally, so to, to learn from each other. Because again, I must say the best uh, medicine to develop or the best uh, tool to develop uh, as a teacher is to exchange and to learn from each other. Very good. Thank you very much, Anton. Please pass the microphone to Treasa Kirk, head of the Irish delegation of the European schools. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, it is my pleasure to be here, and I just want to congratulate the Italian delegation and indeed uh, Parma European School for the absolutely fabulous uh, um, day or, or forum. It has been wonderful. And I do agree, teachers need to be fed. Uh, it, it is essential that teachers and the skills of teachers and the ped pedagogical skills and knowledge skills are developed on an ongoing basis in order to inspire our young people in classrooms and to ensure their success. So that is an essential. Um, and in order to do that, in order to motivate teachers, uh, it, it is essential that various incentives are in place. It might be uh, some of the projects which we uh, experienced yesterday, which were absolutely fantastic. Um, it might be a monetary incentive, a, a type of scholarship. It might be considered at some point in time. It, it would be certainly worth thinking about. Um, and I would also like to pose a number of questions for all of us all of us as teachers, um, are teachers empowered to be creative? Are teachers empowered to be problem solvers, to be responsible? I think of the three R's, uh, not just reading, writing, and mathematics, the teaching of, but also responsibility, respect, and relationships, and enhancing those really important skills, values, and dispositions of our young people. 
um, what kind of collaborative cultures are we promoting and supporting in the European schools? Uh, how, what subliminal messages are we imparting uh, at management level? Are, are teachers' views heard and listened to? All of which are very, very important in order to promote and support teacher development and growth. And I think the most important um, intrinsic motivator for any of us who have taught in classrooms is to work with students, to see students succeed, and to know that you as a teacher have uh, impacted on that success. It, it is really a, a real motivator to, to, to work, work again and work with those students. Um, I think I, mean, I would agree with Ursula in terms of needs-based CPD, C continuum professional development or professional learning, is absolutely essential. It is essential that teachers are involved in the design, development, and, uh, and delivery of CPD in order to draw from the repertoire of, of methodologies and pedagogical approaches it is absolutely a game changer and really, really important. And it is something that we very much promote and support in Ireland. Um, I also maybe would like to suggest an idea <laughs> in terms of how this could be developed at school level. Uh, in Ireland, we have uh, an associate model where teachers are, um, uh, are tra uh, trained, basically, as uh, it, it is a form of capacity building where teachers are trained and then on effective practice methodologies and draw from their own experience as effective practitioners and they share those experiences 15 days a year on an annual basis. And not only has that a huge positive effect for the individual, it also has a, po a positive effect for the school when they return to their classrooms. So that is one idea I think would be uh, uh, really, really important. I would agree as well with my colleagues on the panel that supporting uh, teachers is essential at every level, N not just at leadership level, which is absolutely uh, essential at school management level, but it is also essential for all stakeholders to laud the work of teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I haven't asked you anything because you already answered all my questions. <laughs> so, but I, I, my, my just only question was, which policy and practice have proven to be winning? But you already answered about that based on your experience in Ireland. Yes, I suppose it should, I should say that in Ireland, our teachers are, it is a very long-standing trust in the profession, and that has been enhanced in recent years by extensions to our initial teacher education programs. Um, and now, part of that initial teacher education program is one whole year school placement. That has helped develop positive relationships and very uh, successful relationships between schools and higher education authorities. And that really enhances uh, teachers' understanding of, of school life, not just pedagogy in the classroom. In Ireland as well, as I should say that we have a teaching council, which is a regulatory body, um, and where, whereby the teacher, teaching council promotes supports uh, the teaching profession. It also accredits uh, initial teacher education programs and it organizes events such as this, um, research events or pedagogical events for teachers. It, and it is um, driven by teachers for teachers. We have a national support program for teachers in Ireland, which is an integrated cross-sectoral program called ICHA, which is the Irish word for teacher. And basically, all comprised of seconded teachers and the secondments are renew renewed on an annual basis and that national service it could be perhaps considered on a smaller level or on a smaller scale in the european schools obviously in ireland it would be on a much be bigger national scale it would be a very good way of involving teachers nationally and even to support that national involvement with localized arrangements, such as the associate model I mentioned, the 15 days, or it could be five days or three days. You could also um, have a kind of idea of mentor teacher, um, uh, you know, again, promoting and supporting local, local practice. 
In Ireland also, we have a continuing professional development framework for teachers, and it is great that in the European schools, you also have a continuing professional develop development framework for teachers, which I understand was developed in 2016, reviewed again in 2020, and perhaps it could be reviewed again based on the findings and output of this particular teacher forum. Um, have I something else to say? Um, it is also important again that you know we all support each other at every level. I think that sums up yeah. what I have to say. The, oh, sorry, just one other. <laughs> teacher professional networks. I cannot underestimate the important uh, the importance mm. of teacher professional networks subject associations where teachers meet, share practice, etc. Th thank, thank, thank you very you. much, Teresa, for sharing your experience in uh, Ireland. Uh, Andreas, you want to add something? Y yes, thank you. Um, just very, very briefly, because I think Teresa uh, said many important things, but one word which you used, and it pops up quite often, is the question of empowerment of teachers in the classroom. And I just wanted to use the opportunity, because I know a little bit that you would like now to give Myra the floor, but I would be happy if Myra could also say something about this question of empowerment, because it pops up in many discussions. We had it also in our management training, and I would be interested, if you allow, if, if you course, would empower yes. me for this <laughs> question, um, to, to understand um, what is needed, what is expected from teacher's perspective, um, when it comes to empowerment in the classroom, what is expected maybe from the directors, but maybe also on the system. And maybe Dimitri wants to enter into that later on as well. Sorry for this Th additional thank question. Thank you for the question. No, I'm very because I found it really good. super interesting and yes. I'm, I'm keen to listen and to learn. Yes. And to give a feedback. Thanks. L let's introduce Mayor Martin uh, from uh, Teacher of the European School in Brussels, isn't it? Is correct. Yes. Okay. If you want to answer that. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm really put on the spot here now. This, this is not what I expected. <laughs> but when you talk about empowerment in the classroom, I think, again, there, that's a very personal thing. Um, to a very large extent, I would have to say, I feel empowered in the classroom. Uh, in, it's our domain. We have rules, regulations. We have a lot. We have to abide by. We have a lot we have to follow. But we also have our own approach. And I think that is what's really, really important. And I think unless you go into a classroom feeling in command of the situation, you're lost. Uh, we're going in there. I'm sitting here in front of a group of adults. I feel I'm being scrutinized. But nothing near the scrutiny when you go into a classroom full of adolescents and that, and there you're really on show. You're really being tested. Now, and I think, I think it's a question that does need an awful, because when you say empowered, in certain ways maybe I'd love to have an awful lot more freedom to go beyond the rules and regulations, when I say the rules and regulations, we have a syllabus, we have to follow it, we have to do this. But maybe in some ways, I'd love to have the freedom to go way, way, way beyond it. And still end up being an educator of young people. But, I, I mean, even for me, the word empowerment, it's a question of what exactly does it mean? What exactly does it involve? Um, I think, I mean, I've heard a lot of people, and there's a lot I've heard uh, which is not related to what I expected to speak about here, but I think it's very, very interesting to hear what's going on in national systems, and some of which I am aware, being here an, as an Irish teacher. But um, I think it's something also Dimitri said earlier, which I think is very, very important, because where does what is the most important thing? And it is the individual. You have to start with the individual and what we will make of the opportunities that are made available to us and how we will develop ourselves to, if you like, empower ourselves to have the best possible experience within a classroom situation, and not only limited to the classroom, but within a classroom situation, so as to have a very positive experience in a two-way exchange with our pupils, 
but also then to go further and benefit from what is a wonderful system, but also contribute to the system. And where do we get that? Now, I don't know, have I answered your question? <laughs> you put me on the spot, Andres. <laughs> Th thank you, Mayor. And listen, how can we retain the servants seconded and locally recruited teachers in the European school instead of uh, losing them to other systems? Okay, this is a, a topic that is quite dear to my heart and important to me because I'm, most people, I think, say everybody here knows that we have the different teachers in our schools. We have the seconded teachers, we have the locally recruited teachers. And I think if you want to keep teachers in a system. The most fundamental thing you have to identify with the system. You have to feel you belong to the system. And if I speak first and foremost about locally recruited teachers, and I will say that we appreciate the efforts that have been made in recent years to create the concept of protected posts. But teachers are constantly reminded it is the post that is protected. It is not the person. And consequently, we are losing highly experienced, dedicated, locally recruited teachers from the system every single year. So the first thing we need to do, I think we have to move and strive to move from creating a protected post to protecting a person and keep that person in our system. I would also say regarding then, that's locally recruited. Very s briefly about seconded teachers, I think we all know that integrating into the European system, it does take time, it's a complex system. And I think that a minimum period of secondment should be envisaged. And the minimum period would be nine years for all countries. Uh, and I would even go so far as saying the possibilities exist to extend it. It says, in exceptional cases, up to 12 years. I would say, don't make that the exception. If you have really valuable teachers in the system, try and keep them. And it's not just in the interest of the teacher. Who is core to our system? Why are we all here? It's not teachers, it's pupils. And keep the teachers to benefit the pupils. I then want to talk about a second thing that's really, really important. It's as well as belonging and feeling an identity with the system. It's one thing that was said here, there has to be a recognition of the work done. And I think in terms of careers, everybody would agree, salary is not everything. It has been said here. But I think you would all also agree, salary does matter. And when we come to the European school system, we have such discrepancies. We have, as I've said before, we have a seconded teacher and a locally recruited teacher doing exactly the same job in neighboring classrooms and earning vastly different salaries. What we should strive for is the application of the fundamental European principle the same pay for the same job in the same place. <laughs> I also, sorry, I'm, I'm being as quick as I can because not only teachers need to be fed, everybody needs to be fed. But um, I would also say that we have got the discrepancy between our nursery primary and our secondary colleagues in terms of salary. And we have to address this. I've said it before that it's in the nursery primary schools that the basis is laid. That's where we lay the foundations. I am a secondary school teacher. I have the privilege of welcoming the pupils who have been nurtured from nursery to primary school. And then we are the ones who have the final honor, if you like, of letting them go with this very valuable European baccalaureate. It is a team effort. In most of our member states, teachers are teachers, the salary scales are the same.
And I think we have to move towards that. And another group of people I want to include in this today are the educational advisors, who are extremely important and play a very important role in the European schools. Most of these are qualified teachers. But when they come to the European school system, they also are on a very different salary scale. And I think that for them, it's extremely important that they feel valued in the work that they've done and that they feel there's a recognition of the work that they are doing. And I think I would have to say, I think I said it some time before about the teachers, we're all teachers. I am now including the educational advisors and I'm going to say we are all educators and we are all there working together for the benefit of our pupils and to keep people in the system we must give them that recognition and let them realize that we do truly value the work that they are doing. Now, I'm, I'm not going back to another, I don't think you're going to ask me another question. No, no. But <laughs> if, no. I, I, I don't think no, so. No, no, <laughs> that's all right. But may I just, because I had intended to in the context of another question, and before I leave, I just want to say, we have heard a huge amount of continuous professional development. And as a teacher of the European school systems, yes, continuous professional development is key. And it's very important we all keep abreast of what's happening in our national systems. But I do also want to thank the recent presidencies of the Euro uh, here of the European schools for the focus they have had in their priorities on teachers. And I will mention last year Ireland with the webinars that they developed for the teachers. And this year I would like to very much thank the Italian presidency, delegation, and everybody concerned for the teacher forum. And I think it's extremely important that we develop and nurture this. So I hope it's only the first of many and that it will develop in the future that more teachers can benefit from it and also be inspired by it. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you all the participants of this very interesting session and uh, let's now take uh, another break for a light lunch uh, see you back at here 12 uh, 220 2.20. enjoy if you could see Fish are jumping <laughs> and the cocky is <laughs> The dead is a <laughs> and your mommy <laughs> So hush, little baby, don't you? One all this morning, you're gonna rise up and sleep. And you'll spread your wings. And you'll take to the sky. But till that morning,
Welcome back. Before starting the afternoon plenary session, we listen to the fantastic choir of the European School of Parma, which will perform the European anthem, followed by the Italian one.
And now we would like to hear you singing. Is it okay for you? Just this, these two pieces. The first is in German, okay? You will see the text. So we try to sing uh, immediately without uh, vocalizing. Are you ready? Okay. Fabrizio, could you please? Uh... Okay. Can you read the text? Yeah. Andreas, can you come with me? Andreas? Okay. 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 We just read the first two lines with Andreas together. But I have to look to the text. <laughs> okay. Okay. Together. Freude, schöner Götterfunken. Elysium. The, the sorry, the children are repeating. Okay, we are we are uh, just saying the text once uh, together, once uh, reading the text together, okay. tutto il testo insieme. Freude, schöne Götterfunken, Tochter aus Elysium. Wir betreten Feuertrunken, himmlische ein Heiligtum. Deine Zauber binden wieder, das wie Mode streng gestreift. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein sanfter Flügel weist. Okay. Now, the melody is very simple. Just, uh, just, uh, just the beginning, I sing, I sing just the beginning. Reine schöner Götterfunken, Tochter aus Elysium. Everybody. Wir betreten. Deine Zauber binden wieder, was die Mode streng geteilt. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein sanfter Flügel war. Forte, Freude, schön. Excellent. Great. And now we are in Italy, the Italian presidency, and uh, we are going to recite the text with Antonio Cennini. Yes, the text, no, no, the Italian hymn. Okay. We are going to recite together the text. Senza cantare, però. Senza cantare. Okay. Così per essere sicuro, visto. Ok, 1, 2, 3, 4. Fratelli d'Italia, l'Italia sedesta, dell'elmo di Scipio se cinta la testa, dov'è la vittoria, le porga la chioma, che schiava di Roma e Dio la creò. Stringiamoci a corte, siamo pronti alla morte, siamo pronti alla morte, l'Italia chiamò. Are you ready to sing? Okay. Here there are a little bit more difficulties because there is a piano, but we can do it, okay? You can stand up, yes? Ah. 
fratelli l'Italia l'Italia se ne sta di cinta e cinta Fratelli d'Italia, l'Italia se desta dell'elmo di Scipio, se cinta la testa, dov'è la vittoria, le porga la chioma, che schiava di Roma, il Dio la creò. Stringiamoci a corte, siamo pronti alla morte, siamo pronti alla morte, l'Italia chiamò. Stringiamoci a corte, siamo pronti alla morte, siamo pronti alla morte, l'Italia chiamò. Okay. Wonderful teacher, Benedetta Toni e Rosanna Zerulo, and wonderful pupils, of course. Our technician Fabrizio Maranci with Fabio, they did everything alone. So. Tell us what's going on. I think in a few moments we will hear the video message from the Italian Secretary of Education and Merit, Giuseppe Valditare. It's a pre-recorded message. So as soon as the technician is ready. Distinguished guests, it is a great pleasure to address you 
on the occasion of the closing session of, the, of this first uh, Teachers Forum of the European Schools. As you all know, Italy has uh, been one of the founding uh, countries of the European school system. We host uh, European uh, school in uh, Varese and two accredited European uh, schools in Brindisi and in Parma. More than 10% of the students enrolled in the European schools are Italian and 120 Italian teachers are part of the educational staff. We are therefore very proud to be able to offer our contribution as Italian presidency at a key moment of the future of the European schools. Taking into account the recommendations of the European Parliament's report on the system of European schools and the leveraging on the outcomes of the Irish presidency, we have created this first event which celebrates the European schools and their role towards the achievement of the European education area. Evidence data on the impact of a crisis on education are showing a decline of learning outcomes and the urgent need of reforms to offer significant learning experiences, supporting the development of everyone's talents through a personalization of students' pathways. We cannot achieve this goal without a competent, engaged and motivated teachers, which must be supported through continuous training and mobility opportunities. This experience of the Teachers Forum represents a good occasion to support the professional development of teachers. Drawing inspiration from uh, each uh, country's uh, successes and uh, challenges. I hope uh, this uh, edition may represent the first of many subsequent uh, ones. The Italian presidency is also the first one to present uh, a new action plan as a follow-up uh, to the European Parliament uh, report that the Board of Governors is called to adopt. I strongly believe that thanks to the work of the Board of Governors and the contribution of this first Teachers Forum, we can achieve a positive advancement towards a new vision of the system, also with the establishment of networks of European schools and the creation of more European schools in the Objective One regions, starting from the south of Italy. In line with the European education area, the European Parliament has identified some key areas of intervention through your valuable work, we can address the two key issues of reforming the system and valorizing our most valuable resource, the potential and talents of our youth. Together, we can transform the European school system into the best European example of high quality, multilingual, and multicultural education. Thank you.
I can hear the strange laugh. I don't know. It's, <laughs> oh, <clears throat> it's our minister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, it's time for the next panel, whose title is The Future of Education in the European Education Area. So as soon as we are ready, I would like to invite all the participants to join me here at the table, specifically Diana Saccardo, European School Inspector, <laughs> Manuel Bordoy, European School System Deputy Secretary General, Alper Hilmatz, European School Inspector, Secondary Cycle, <laughs> Annabella Gracio, Central Coordinator for Educational Support and Inclusive Education at Secretary General Office, Sandra Ribic, Deputy Director, Primary Cycle, European School Luxembourg, and Roberto Ricci, President of Invalsi and Italian President of uh, European Baccalaureate. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to everybody. <laughs> We're going to share the microphone as before, of course. I would like to start with Diana Saccardo. If you can give us the principles and the objectives of the European uh, education area. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, as you can see <laughs> from the flag, I was not supposed to be sitting here. But unfortunately, uh, because uh, of uh, family circumstances, uh, Annalisa Cannoni, who is a um, policy officer of the European Commission, um, couldn't be here. And uh, even she was not able to record her intervention. So the purpose was that she could uh, set the scene of the European education area. Um, the European education area, um, sh sh short phrase, has come up several times. So I think that it is important just to uh, try to illustrate um, its main principles and objectives. So. Um, why am I sitting here? Not just because I'm an inspector of the national system or uh, an inspector of the European schools, but because I'm the governmental representative nominated by the Ministry of Education and Merit in the working group school, as uh, I also Annabella is uh, for the European schools. So, um, in these, uh, there are several working groups, uh, and uh, they, these working groups should um, support um, the, the European members to make the European education area a reality. So, let's start to see where this uh, uh, European education area comes from. Um, in uh, 2017, uh, the Rome Declaration contains a commitment to work towards a union in which young people receive the best education and training and can study and find a job across the continent. In the same year, that is uh, in uh, 2017, uh, the Commission sets out its vision of the European education area as a common space of the continent of Europe for quality education and lifelong learning for all across the border. So the three main principles are quality education, lifelong learning, inclusiveness, and let's say mobility, because Europe should allow um, as a continent uh, to have mobile workers, mobile students, uh, mobile teachers, and should be a source of attraction. So at the Gothenburg Summit, um, the European Parliament, uh, the Council and the Commission proclaim the European pillar of social rights, uh, where the first principle uh, contained in this declaration states that everyone 
as the right to quality and inclusive education, training, and uh, lifelong learning. And in 2019, uh, um, the, uh, the president of the commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, pledged to make the European education area a reality by 2025-2025. So let's say that the deadline is approaching. So more and more we are talking about the European education area. Um, another important step is the communication from the Commission to the European Parliament in 2020 on achieving the European education area by 2025. And uh, um, which identifies six dimensions uh, on the basis of each uh, of these dimension, of each of these dimensions, the, uh, the resolution of February 2025 identifies five strategic priority areas. And these priority areas are um, quality, equity, inclusion, and success for all green and digital transition, teachers and trainers, so that's why we are also talking and uh, focusing on teachers, um, higher education and uh, lifelong learning and mobility. So um, what is meant by quality? Uh, first of all, mastery of basic skills, including digital competencies. And then I think that some of, in this panel, some of you will elaborate on this concept. And uh, uh, also the European um, school system, we uh, have a lot of discussion on how to embed the eight key competencies into the curriculum, into the syllabi. So this is not, uh, it, it, the, the origin of all this is not just uh, a top-down approach, but it is, uh, um, it is a way to reach all together the European education area, because these are the basic skills, together with the mastery of transversal competencies, and also the promotion of language learning and multilingualism, just to recall something that we have heard a lot over these two days and the introduction of a European perspective in, in education. So if all these are the main, uh, um, the main ideas behind quality in education, well, we can make a reflection of what we are doing as European schools, but also as the Italian system. And uh, um, as to inclusion and gender equality, uh, the main ideas behind this, this uh, strategic priority areas is the educational attainment that should be decoupled from social, economic, and cultural status, and a robust and inclusive uh, lifelong learning strategies that should enable um, those who left education early to resume it. And finally, because I'm stopping here, because I don't want to, t uh, to take too much time, teachers and trainers. So we need highly competent, enthusiastic, and committed professional teachers. Um, and uh, the, the teaching also, the teaching profession should be revalued socially, and uh, in some member states uh, also in financial uh, terms. Only one in five lower secondary teachers feel that their profession is valued by society and about half of them mention a high burden as a stress factor in the profession. And uh, um, this comes from the, the, the TALIS, uh, you know the TALIS is the, the OECD International Teaching and Learning Survey that show that a significant number of teachers express the need to develop their skills to teach students with special needs, um, use of digital technology and teaching in multilingual and multicultural classrooms. So in order to achieve 
together with the member states and stakeholders, the ambitious European education area by 2025, according to the priorities that I've listed and briefly illustrated, some recommendations uh, were published so far and some initiative uh, um, implemented. I just want to recall some of the most important recommendations. So first of all, the recommendation on key competencies for lifelong learning, and all, I'm sure that you are all familiar with it, uh, both from uh, the uh, European uh, um, school uh, system side, but also from the Italian side, because uh, uh, quite recently we published the certificate at the end that, that has to be filled in at the end of primary, lower secondary, and uh, at the end uh, of uh, mandatory uh, education at the age of 16 that is based on the key competencies, eight key competencies uh, uh, template, let's say. Another important uh, recommendation is the one that was published in 2018, and it is a council recommendation on a comprehensive approach to the teaching and learning of languages. And this is very important uh, for the achievement of the European education area, and it recommends that member states uh, uh, in addition to the language of schooling, ensure that young people acquire a second language in order to use it effectively in different domains uh, and a third language with which they can interact quite fluently. But this recommendation is also important because it states the principle of uh, language aware schools and uh, um, in, in, in this sense, I'm recalling what uh, Mrs. Kunan said yesterday um, regarding the language repertoire of the individual, where there should be no hierarchy between languages, because all the languages have the same importance uh, and uh, contribute to the cultural identity of the individual. Very important is also the recommendation, Pathways to School Success, uh, uh, which gives the name of uh, the, the uh, strand of the working group school uh, that I belong to that was published in November uh, 2022. And it suggests that the most effective measure to reduce early school leaving and improve student performance uh, in reading, mathematics, and science subjects. Uh, um, so it gives some hints uh, on how to improve uh, uh, skills in these uh, three uh, subjects. Uh, and of course, they are the subjects that are tested through the PISA survey. And it also emphasizes certain aspects uh, to which a member state should pay particular attention to. And the key element is well-being at school. And I know that this is a topic that is deeply felt by the students of the European schools as well. And, uh, mm, and because the social, psychological, and emotional uh, well-being affects educational success and, of course, prevents dropout. Because if the, 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 the student, if the pupil feels well, I mean, uh, uh, their motivation um, increases and, of course, their performance at schools improves. And uh, finally, as to teachers, just because this is part of, uh, um, uh, of course, I could list many more recommendations and give brief illustrations, but I, yes, one uh, a piece of advice that I can give is just to visit the website, uh, Google uh, European Education Area, because the title of this panel is the future of education in the European Education Area. So I think that it is extremely important to be aware of what it is and what it entails. And um, yes, during uh, our, for our Turner presidency, we have identified two main priorities. The second one is focused on teachers, and it has two main deliverables. The first one is the organization of this uh, uh, teachers forum, and the second one is the development of a teacher career framework that we're going to start very soon. And uh, so um, the, the European Commission has published the policy guidelines uh, uh, for the development of 
career framework, thereby supporting the career advancement of school education professionals. And as it was said this morning, I think it, it was the um, Mr. S um, Secretary General said that it is not, um, the career is not to be understood just as a vertical progression, but also as horizontal um, progression in the sense that teachers can do one thing um, without becoming, for example, a school principal and uh, can, have, can be tasked with some um, activities um, for a period and then they can change and can do something else or at the same time do one thing and another thing. But what is important is what the teacher does is recognized and becomes part of their career. So thank you for your attention. Many thanks to Diana Saccardo, European School Inspector, for your comprehensive uh, overview. And now let's start uh, with, if it's OK for you, I'm going to ask a couple of questions each, starting with Manuel Bordoy, European School System Deputy Secretary General. How can we encourage collaboration and knowledge sharing among European countries? And uh, how can education contribute to Europe's enlargement and to the progress of third countries? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, be before answering the question, I would like to uh, thank uh, the Italian presidency for this wonderful initiative. And uh, it would be fantastic that we, we can continue this over the years. And we will try to, to make an effort and support it from the office of the Secretary General, as we have done this this time, and um, uh, to that end, I would like also to um, uh, to thank um, all the people in the office of the Secretary General that has uh, supported uh, with uh, different administration tasks uh, the, the organization of of this uh, first teacher forum, and especially uh, Girolamo Molucania, which uh, who will be <laughs> among us because uh, he's. He's done a fantastic, uh, a fantastic job. But we were talking about encouraging collaboration and uh, knowledge uh, sharing. And uh, you know that there are many things uh, being done at the moment for collaboration and, and for knowledge sharing. This is one of them, for example. Um, the European Commission has uh, also uh, very interesting initiatives. Everybody knows, for example, e-twinning. And everybody knows, for example, the Erasmus Plus uh, program. Uh, exchange, mobility, those are really important keywords. Now, what is, what is not being done and what could be done? And uh, here, Diana has mentioned uh, guidelines, recommendations. We need to go further. We, we need to go further and, and we need to go uh, beyond recommendations and guidelines. If we really and truly want um, uh, European education space. Uh, everybody knows that uh, um, national systems, they can accept those recommendations, they can implement it in the way they want or not. Uh, and uh, even in the same country, I mean like uh, from government to government, you see plenty of uh, changes in the education system. That is something that it's affected immediately when there is a, a change of government. Let's not talk about uh, countries with uh, different regional governments where in the same country we have many different education systems. If we have to benchmark, if we have to compare to each other, we have to try to standardize and we have to try to, to harmonize. That means being more generous, being more generous and taking those uh, recommendations into, into binding commitment. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, the European schools, we, we are doing like that because we are the only Europe-wide uh, system and uh, actually when the European Commission issues a recommendation, we take it as, you know, like we need to implement this. I mean, a good example is the eight key competencies. We are embedding the eight key competencies into our, into our curriculum uh, and, and uh, many, many other um, initiatives uh, for example in uh, uh, in inclusive education we, we try to, to to bring them into into our system we we, we would like to to um, uh, think of us as a test bed for those um, 
initiatives are for those uh, changes in, in, in policy, in educational policy and in, in innovation. And it is true, it has been said that we need to be more visible. We need to be more present, we need to be more of an example and we need to give more uh, to um, national systems. We, we are a proof that it can be done. And, uh, uh, we, uh, and, and then I think that what um, national systems should, should work on is a bit of uh, on this generosity on leaving their national political agendas aside and thinking a bit wider. Um, then uh, I, I think that a very important uh, action that could uh, be taken, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, to talk about uh, many more, would be to uh, start with um, the establishment of a common European-wide initial teacher training framework. I mean, like all teachers in Europe should be equipped with the, uh, with the uh, a common set of uh, skills and competencies. That would be something very important. And another thing would be to work also on the common teaching standards and quality assurance mechanisms all Europe-wide so that we, we can benchmark, benchmark and we can have data that tells us where we are and where and, and, and they, those data will um, uh, help us to take decisions of where we should be going and what actions we should be taking. So that would be a, a, a really important to, way to, to cooperate, but to cooperate we need those two tools. We need uh, a, a common uh, framework of uh, initial training for all teachers and we need also common quality assurance mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, listen, thank you. Uh, which mechanism are needed to ensure accountability and transparency in uh, education governance while allowing flexibility and innovation experimentation, as you said? Yeah, uh, uh, as, um, as I explained, um, uh, we need uh, clear, clear objectives and, and, and clear, clear standards. We, we need uh, to have um, a good uh, data collection and, and, and reporting uh, tools. Maybe also some uh, external uh, evaluation and, and, um, and review of our, of our practices. It is also very important uh, stake stakeholder engagement and, and this I think we have also in our, in, uh, in our system. Where it's, it's important to uh, listen to, to everybody, to, to hear where um, are the, the concerns and the worries. But as, as it was said yesterday, I mean like not for the uh, fact that you have a heart, you are a cardiologist. So um, sometimes it's also good, I mean like that uh, we build this idea that we need to be trusted. We are the professionals and, uh, and we, we listen to you but we will bring the solutions. You don't have to, I mean, like, tell us what to do. We know what to do. And um, then, of course, uh, accountability mechanisms uh, and, and transparency and visibility, it's uh, very important, as it is also uh, flexibility for innovation, as, and as it has been said, professional development and support. But if you allow me, Stefano, I, I, I wanted to, um, to go to, uh, because your first question was a double question, because you were talking also about um, uh, progress into uh, third, uh, third countries. And uh, so, so far, I mean, like the, the European school uh, system is a good model for uh, the countries in, in Europe. But it could also be a really important uh, soft diplomacy tool for neighboring countries and even for countries that uh, can be um, uh, of a strategic alliance uh, to Europe. I mean, like we, we, we've seen what is uh, happening in the world uh, and, uh, and a, 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 a really um, um, educational system that uh, it's value driven. It's very important nowadays, I mean like to export, I mean like so that we can export the values, the values that need to be well defined, I mean like as, as it was said yesterday, is, uh, I mean, when we talk about a value, we need to make a good definition of it. And the, if we want to promote peace, justice, human rights, I think we can, we can use uh, education as a soft uh, diplomacy tool for, for that. 
and uh, I'm, I'm sure that the European schools could play a significant role there as well. Thank you. Definitely agree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. Let's turn to Alper Ilmaz, European School Inspector of Secondary Cycle. Um, yes, switch on. Let's lift it. Okay, no. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, yes, now it's working. Um, so we know that one of your areas of interest is AI. And let's go back to speak about AI. And what is your vision for the future of uh, AI in uh, education? Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for all uh, of you that have organized this uh, event and uh, also for having invited me. Um, <coughs> so I will talk a bit about AI, and uh, it's true that I'm interested in AI, and that interest um, started some years ago. Uh, I had the fortune of having very good teachers, and having good teachers, what that does to you is that you want to continue learning even after you have left school, because learning has been a pleasant experience. So I took a course on something called computational neuropsychology, which is basically learning about how the brain works through uh, um, mathematical models and simulations. And as you can guess, this is uh, very much related to AI. And uh, really what I try to accomplish is not something new. I try to understand human nature or some, uh, human phenomenon by looking at our latest toy, our latest invention. This has happened many times when we invented, for example, pumps. Then we saw the human bo body consist of a system of pumps that is moving around. When we invited the steam engine, we saw the human being as some kind of steam engine. You, you have probably heard the expression, let off some steam. Um, when we inv uh, invented making watches with tiny cogwheels, we imagined the universe being a, a watch that God started. So we try to do this. We try to understand ourselves and the reality around us by things we create ourselves. Isn't that, I think that that's very fascinating. But um, coming to the more concrete on AI, we shouldn't really focus on AI just because there is a rapid rate of release of products uh, from uh, San Francisco Bay Area based companies, uh, but more about um, what are the challenges we have in front of us and see how can AI possibly play a role in addressing those uh, problems or challenges. We have the climate crisis, we have uh, demographic challenges with an aging population, uh, with declining birth rates. Who is going to do all the jobs that is needed to maintain or improve the current level uh, living standards, for example? So AI could potentially play a role in balancing this equation. But we m must also keep in mind, of course, that AI comes with its own challenges that we need to address. But when it comes to AI and ed education, AI flows into education quite naturally. I would say, uh, in, I use three questions. I say the what of education, the how of education, and the why of education. And uh, with the what of education, I simply mean what are we learning in schools, the content. So uh, we must address the question of how does AI impact what we are learning? And um, this has many uh, aspects. One is, of course, which was mentioned earlier, the AI literacy. Uh, we can also talk about AI and democracy. Uh, this is, these are things that all students must be familiar with. Then we have specialized knowledge for those that want to go deeper. Uh, the director of this beautiful school mentioned that why don't we have an AI curriculum? I agree. Uh, I have been part of a team uh, creating a, a curriculum for AI in my national system. Uh, I'm only a, a math inspector in this system, but you can see in the advanced math course, I have actually introduced AI uh, as a topic. Um, so, so, so that aspect is definitely uh, very important. What are we learning in school? Uh, the how question is, uh, 
how do we use AI for learning, uh, to support learning? Uh, we see that chatbots that we've uh, seen emerging uh, the, the last few years can play uh, potentially a very big role in uh, supporting students in their learning journey. For example, giving them feedback on their uh, writing, um, during their writing process and so on. And finally, the why of learning. Let me put it like this, I think this is a relevant question for us. Uh, why should I learn another language? Uh, in a few years, uh, I will be able to uh, wear headphones, you speak in your language, I will have immediate translation in here in my native language. Or I can have glasses where I read a text in a foreign language, the glasses show me my native language. So why? Um, I think you can make an analogy, a comparison. Why do people go, for example, the, to the gym and run on a treadmill or jog outside for kilometers? No one is expected to chase their own food or uh, people lift hundreds of kilos in the gym. No one has grocery bags that heavy. <laughs> um, so why, why do we do it? It's good for us. We are biological creatures, so this is good for us. So when we think about AI in education, let's keep in mind that learning requires some effort and some pain. Uh, let's not remove this effort that is required for learning. Uh, learning should not be easy. It should be the right kind of difficult, uh, the, the kind of difficult that makes us grow. Uh, so. Uh, but but AI can definitely play a huge role in these three aspects, the what, the how, and the why of education. Thank, thank you. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you, what will be the positive impact of AI in education from now to the years coming? Yes, uh, so the way I see it is quite simple because we have two parameters. The most valuable resource we have in schools are our teachers and their time. And the most important process we have in schools is our students or our pupils and their learning. So if AI is, is to have a, a positive impact in education, these are the two things we have to address. And looking at uh, students and uh, their learning, uh, we see that AI has the potential to be this support that is available around the clock, uh, always awake, doesn't need any coffee. Uh, you can ask questions and get a personal, a personalized support adapted to you. Um, and I know that teachers, if they had the time, uh, would like to adapt more uh, to their students. But this is a strength of AI. Uh, I'm not saying that the technology is quite that mature yet that I would feel confident in leaving a student by themselves with, uh, with an AI. But this is uh, definitely the, uh, a potential that, uh, that I see and that can be become a, a reality. And when it comes to uh, the other side, uh, with teachers and their time, how can uh, AI help uh, teachers with many of their tasks so they can use their competence in the best possible uh, way? Um, are teachers to be replaced by AI? Is there a concern for this? Uh, personally, I would say no. Uh, I heard someone say the other day that if a teacher can be replaced by AI, then that teacher probably deserves it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but um, I think when it comes to um, uh, sitting with your computer and having this personalized learning, that is one very powerful aspect of learning, but it's not uh, the full story because learning also has a social uh, component and learning together. And this has been tested over time. Um, I call this storytelling. Um, th this is, used to be the primary means of uh, transfer of knowledge. The elders of the tribe sat around the campfire with the younger generations. They told stories which contained knowledge about where are the threats, where are the tigers, don't go there. And uh, uh, here are the opportunities, the fruits and the berries, go there and so on. 
so th this is quite natural for humans to learn in a social context. So if we can combine the best of both worlds, the personalized learning and the social aspects of learning, then I think uh, we can gain a lot. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think we need more intelligence, uh, both human and artificial. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. very much. Now we have Annabella Grassio, Central Coordinator for Educational Support and uh, Inclusive Education of the Office of the Secretary General of the European Schools. Annabella, <laughs> inclusive education is one of the goals of the European education area. How do you think it can become a reality in uh, education in Europe? Thank you very much for the question and for the opportunity. In fact, inclusive education is already on the way. Um, inclusive education is not a place or a state where we are, it's a journey. And we are in different points on this journey towards inclusion. We have in a European schools system and here we have 27 different educational systems and all each of these educational system is in diff at different points of uh, uh, the way, the journey towards inclusion. And our role should be not to finger point, you are more inclusive than, than others, but to look at ourselves and see where are we and how can we progress towards the main goal that is inclusive education. The European education area has the main principle, it is and I quote, removing barriers to learning and improving access to quality education for all. And I would add, all means all. Regardless of race, sexual orientation, um, gender, uh, minorities, ability. So we all have to look at education, inclusive education, benefiting all pupils not only those at the risk of marginalization, but to all pupils, all kids in the classroom. Because the main question that we should ask ourselves is the following. What kind of society do we want to have in the future? Is it a society where we have uh, separate, uh, so some uh, uh, citizens go to one place and others go to another place based on their uh, characteristics or do we want to have a society where everybody has a place and can play a significant uh, meaningful uh, role in society if this is the last one is the right answer then we should have we have to have inclusive education because it, inclusive education means tolerance and tolerance, you do not teach tolerance without experiencing it, without living it. So you have to do, there is no way. But there is two more reasons, there are more, but two more reasons that uh, justify the need and these uh, overall um, uh, principle of inclusive education. The second one is economical. The costs of exclusion and segregation are much higher than the investment on inclusive education. And it's not me telling it. OECD, which is, let us not forget, an economic organization of countries, so they are based on economic principles, they have a set of investigation, research and literature defending and advocating for inclusive education. Because they know that in the end, the costs of ex exclusion are much higher. And finally, there is another reason, and this makes inclusive education an imperative, which is it is clearly enshrined in two conventions that were signed by all member states. Mm -hmm. One is the rights of uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Article 2nd and the others clearly state that no child should be discriminated for any reason. The second one is 
the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 24. And yesterday you listened to one professor mentioning it. But there is a piece of information that is missing. Article 24 of the Convention should be read with what is called a general comment number four from the United Nations that clarifies the concept. And we need to clarify what is inclusive education, what is reasonable accommodation, so that we have a common understanding. I was asked not to mention specifically the European schools, but I have to make the link with what uh, Manuel has just said. We have in our system 24, 27 different mem uh, uh, educational systems. So we had to find, we have a policy that applies to all European schools, meaning everybody working in the European school system. So we have to find a compromise. We can see, we can be the laboratory of inclusive education applied at European level. Of course, some countries, and we listened yesterday, some countries are more advanced. Inclusive education is based on three main principles. Access to education, participation in activities, educational activities, and possibilities of success. And success is read, means the possibility of finding, developing every kid, every pupil in our school to the maximum of their potential. So that is the main principles that we have regarding uh, inclusive education that is completely aligned with the European education area. Thank you. Um, Lisa and Annabella, w which measures can be implemented to promote diversity, equity and inclusion in the European education systems? Well, diversity is already there. Yeah. We, our schools, our classrooms are diverse. So what we need to ask, I've just mentioned th three reasons why we should develop, is why? And the second one is how. So, and I think that we also have identified the many barriers to inclusive education. And when we identify systematically the barriers, we can find ways to address, to reduce or overcome, eliminate those barriers. And inclusive education is based on four main, uh, it's applied in four main principles. The first one is culture in the school culture and organization. The, the second one is curriculum. The third one is assessment. And the fourth one is um, um, pedagogy. So we know that the teachers have played an important role. And what I think it is missing here, or we need more, is training. Most of the teachers here, I, I'm, I dare to ask or to assume, in our initial teacher education, we did not study uh, inclusive education. We were not prepared to address the diversity in the classroom. So what we need is, uh, and coming back to the word empowerment, that I would like to translate to capacity building, in the schools. We have to have at system level to create the conditions. We have to have the management aligned with the vision of inclusive education, the teachers aligned with the, teacher, the, the principles of inclusive education, and the support that is needed to build capacity and to create the conditions to work in the classroom. So these are the main principles, not work. And I will finish with two examples of how we are progressing. Sometimes we look at the things that are left to be done and we feel very tired. But we have done a long way, long way. Let me give you an example. Dyslexia. Dyslexia represents, uh, studies say, 10% of the population, which means 800 million people around the world that suffer or uh, have the condition of dyslexia. And it is a lot of potential that we are throwing away if we do not find the means to overcome 
this, um, uh, the, to uh, unlock the potential. And um, I'm going to tell you a story um, that uh, it's not my story, it's Alper Ilma's uh, uh, story. Um, he, not long ago, I mean, some uh, decades ago, <laughs> dyslexia was considered as, I'm going to read, uh, non-educational skilled people. So, it is, it is not long ago. Albert Ilmus told me a story, told us a story, of a taxi driver that he found once, and they start talking. And um, he, uh, Albert told that he worked in the area of education. And uh, um, the, 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 the taxi driver said, oh, education, I've just fin finished secondary education. He was about 50 years old. And I said, ha, ah, Albert, ha. Ah. Great, so you are now trying a new job. He said, no, 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 no. I finished this secondary education, but because of when I was at school, I was considered, I considered myself and probably others as uh, stupid, not possible to be, to be, to progress. And I wanted to prove myself that I can do it. And it did, because teachers you, regardless that you, in your uh, initial teacher training, you did not study, you improve. You do the extra mile to support the kids. Yesterday, today, we, we heard, I was there, I listened to all um, uh, presentations uh, of the uh, uh, examples, the workshops from yesterday. And I would say that almost all, if not all, mentioned inclusion. And for me, this is very, very important because we are stressing the teachers are working in this domain. So to answer your question, we are on the way. There are still things to be done, but we are uh, on the way. Good, thank you. Thank you very much, Annabella, for sharing your views. Let's now speak with Sandra Ribic, Deputy Director, Primary Cycle, European School, Luxembourg. Um, Sandra, how can education systems share a common understanding of uh, education based on quality and inclusiveness in order to make a European education area come true? Um, thank you so much for inviting me and it's, it's really tricky to, to answer your question and not repeating everything that was said already, uh, I <laughs> so I try this. my very best. <laughs> But um, I think it starts one part, it was said so often is um, sitting here in this round is um, it's all there. We heard it yesterday, we heard it today. It's all there. We do not need another document. We do not need another working group. We do not need another discussion. We know exactly what we have to do to make an EEA, this uh, European Education Area, really uh, lively come true. And um, one critical part, I think it was said very often, but I would like to repeat it, is really that um, it starts with our support. We have to support the teachers, and if we want to make the EEA come, really come true in reality, we have to value our educators and teachers. Because as we heard yesterday, my wife is a teacher. That's, we know that, we are teachers by heart, that's not enough. We have really, we know that, but we have to show the others that that is not enough. We have to make them aware, as Manuel just said, it's, it's professional, it's, it's the profession at all. It's, it's we are the people with the students. And I think recognizing and restoring the prestige of, of educators across all, all levels is, is vital. And I know I heard it yesterday and again today, we do not like to talk about salaries. <laughs> well, we have to. Uh, sorry, even me, I have to repeat that uh, this, what we want, can be achieved through competitive salaries and through professionalism and, and but what we heard just before in the, in the panel, promotion of, of opportunities and or it's called career or not. And we never should forget that um, it's our educators and teachers that they shape the future citizens. So we have to support them. And um, 
we have to be loud, and uh, Manuel said that. Uh, we have to make aware that we are uh, the professional people to, to shape the future, and don't be shy. It's very funny, I think last year I already discussed it with Manuel or with Andreas, I can't remember. Um, we are never shy in sight. In the system, we, we are very transparent, we are very clear, we are very direct, we don't hold back, but when it comes to outside school, we are very reluctant. Nobody knows about us. I don't understand. Be loud, be clear, be, be professional and tell uh, the world that we are there. And there we come to the point also, another point I think to have a success or successful in the common shared understanding of education and what just you said, and it was interesting to hear that yesterday, is we have to instill values. We have to talk about that. And it's not easy because we understand, we have a different understanding of values. Freedom for me might be completely a different understanding than for all of you. But um, there, and I come back to what Manuel already said, it's education systems have to work together. We, we have to work on this if we really want to make it a common approach. Um, sitting here and having this, this Great opportunity um, brings me to the next point where I think we need effective communication. And, and I had a lot of talks uh, during these days and I know uh, we always say, oh, we get so long emails, these people have so much time, oh, I cannot read them. Yes, but on the other hand, we have to read it. But what it makes important and the outcome of, of also some of my chats with people is we have to meet, we have to talk, direct communication and forget about, we don't have to write books to communicate with each other. We have to be on the table and to talk to each other. And if I can allow myself to be loud, meaning that perhaps next year, I'm looking forward to have the next uh, teachers forum, I, I'd wish to have two panels from teachers for teachers with teachers. Um, I, I'd like to add a very last point to answer your question is, and uh, I think uh, to be successful in a fruitful area, education, European education area is also promoting the teaching profession. As I said, we are very shy, we, we hold back, we excuse, I, I, sometimes I have the impression we, ha we find excuses why we are teachers. No, it's the contrary. We have to be proud that we are teachers. Because what we know, it's, it's, it's the rich, rewarding nature of teaching that needs to be promoted uh, to the young people, to young students at universities. And it's our mission to tell everybody that we know that I think teaching is great and awesome. It's, it's probably the best job you can ever have. And <laughs> I still miss it not teaching for the last years, it's, and, and we stay teachers by heart, don't we? And so it's not a burden being a teacher or an educator. It's, it's something great. And I think if we are proud and clear and transparent, we will find and motivate young uh, students from university to become teachers again and be in this education area. Thank you, Sandra. Um, <laughs> Speaking about values, what can education system do to prepare students uh, to be active and responsible citizens in a multicultural Europe? Um, also here, the answers were already partially given, and I would like to refer what what Manuel said. That um, I truly believe that we need a common a common approach, but we need a European. I would even go further. I would not say a common education uh, uh, training, but I would even go into a European values education. The idea from the Parliament's report to integrate a module on European values or, or visions in teacher training programs, I think that can ensure that educators across the continent uh, share this kind of common understanding, because they need training to be able to share and talk about values and visions with their students. We had that so often the last, today and yesterday, that just do it. That's not enough. You would never ask a doctor uh, or, uh, to say, okay, just do it. Do a heart operation. Just look at the video and do it. We would clearly say, you need training, and that's the same for our teachers. So I very much like the idea that we could include 
a common education, a, a module in teachers' trainings regarding visions and, and values of especially the European Union, because I'm not so sure if we are all able to repeat the values that are clearly set in the, in the Lisbon Treaty. So human dignity, freedom, democracy, and so on. I'm not so sure if we all can, can repeat them by heart, and only if we know them ab about them and we are clear about the meaning, we can then discuss that with the students, and they will become um, responsible citizens, citizens of a multicultural Europe. Um, what you said, I, I think we need that what we do is, is multicultural projects. That's clear. I do not want to go uh, further there because that, that's rich. That's where we, we share. That's where we are curious. That's where we open our eyes and say, okay, wow, it's just brilliant what you do. And congratulations to all schools who were uh, presenting the workshops. It's so rich and that's what we need. And I already heard, okay, I would like to do the same and how can we implement that in our school? And that's what we have to do. That's, that's the only thing. We also have to motivate exactly what we do here in classrooms. A classroom should be arenas for open discussions and, and, and debates and even sometimes debates that go into a direction we are not so fine with, but that's, that's rich and that's, we have to motivate uh, the students that they are allowed to talk about in a respectful way and you do not always have to share everything 100% with your students, that's fine, or with the teacher, that's vice versa. And to finish uh, that, um, I cannot, I have the same as, as Annabella, I cannot avoid to say that what we talked about and what we need is uh, uh, <laughs> we in the European school system, we have. It's the European school system is a role model. Let's go outside because highlighting our successes and frameworks of European uh, schooling models that emphasize inclusiveness and cultural, cultural awareness, we have that. That can set and should set benchmarks in Europe. We, for us, it's very natural. Well, I discussed yesterday with the, with the directors and he said, I'm so proud because in my school, I have all the languages, all the nations, I, I have whole Europe. What a feeling to enter the school every single day. And I think um, there, for me, we should and we shall and we can shine because whole Europe wants what we already have and we have to share with them our experience because honestly we are brilliant just let all the others know thank you thank you very much Sandra. <laughs> let's finish this very interesting panel with roberto ricci president of Invalsi and italian president of the european baccalaureate so roberto what is your view of the relationship between traditional basic skills and uh, digital skills as uh, envisaged by Digicom 2.2 and uh, Digicom PayDU. <coughs> thank you, thank you for inviting me. This is a very interesting uh, uh, opportunity for me. I would like to start uh, uh, mm, with a point that I learned a new thing for me. Uh, this way to see uh, evaluation or to find or to set um, a comprehensive standard as a generosity, uh, how a way to be generous uh, towards uh, uh, the future. I think it's very interesting. And uh, mm, from my perspective, I think that the European school system could be a very uh, rather important uh, uh, place where we can learn a lot of things. But at the same time, we should take into consideration that we are speaking about a very specific area. And uh, I think that our duty, our specific duty, is to keep uh, very clear in mind that the basic skills uh, still uh, have uh, um, plays, play a very, very important role. And we have to measure it and uh, uh, find a way uh, to be sure that the, uh, these competencies, these skills, 
uh, are so important for the uh, normal students, the everyday students. For uh, Sorry if I used uh, the, the word normal, I know that is not so modern, but uh, I prefer to use a simple, simple word. And uh, uh, mm, I would like to say uh, mm, we should, uh, through the uh, basic skills, considering the implication in terms of uh, a, a digital transition as well, uh, that uh, uh, the only way to realize, from my perspective, of course, from my perspective, to realize the, the all important things that we heard today is to find a, a way to realize it in a, a very practical way, about, about speaking of millions of students, poor students, students that uh, uh, have a condition in their families, in their uh, social backgrounds, uh, not, th not that simple. I fully agree with you that to be a teacher is uh, excellent, is exciting, is uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, I do believe it. I hope, so, I hope it's so. But uh, uh, when we speak uh, about the uh, social prestige, uh, uh, about the teacher, we are not speaking only about money. Uh, but we should be very humble and practical to say, I think uh, maybe the, in the teacher profession we are reaching uh, the same situation that we mm, faced in the last 20 or 30 years uh, in the medical professions. It's not only about money, of course money is extremely important, but it is also to support our teachers uh, in, in terms of training, in terms of uh, uh, the condition where they have to work, uh, uh, how they have to work, uh, uh, about the social or psychological uh, difficulties. This is the way that we have to uh, combine. And so, uh, uh, mm, inclusion for me, inclusion for me, from my perspective, is uh, uh, mm, to be aware that we need uh, measures and to be sure that we are uh, uh, in the condition to uh, guarantee to everybody, at, at least uh, the largest part of our population, our ba basic skills. Otherwise, from my perspective, uh, or according to our researches, uh, we are facing other forms of dropout. In European uh, uh, countries, of course, dropout is extremely uh, relevant topic uh, that we have to face it and uh, uh, find solution in order to reduce it. But uh, from my perspective, if we don't have the generosity to have uh, common measures, uh, inclusion could be, uh, uh, became in, in the near future, a kind of implicit dropout. I mean, uh, we should be sure that we are not only include people in terms that we keep them at school, that is extremely important, nothing to say, but what they are learning. And I think inter uh, inter uh, artificial intelligence could be very, very important because we need time. We need time and even our fantastic teachers, have the, the, the day of our fantastic teachers consists of 24, uh, 10, 24, uh, 24 hours. And so maybe uh, in the, uh, artificial intelligence is a way to find time and to translate in a practical way what we understand in terms of inclusion. It's very, very easy, sorry if I'm so unpolite, to include uh, everyone in a situation where I was speaking about differences of languages, but we, co we share the value of culture, of education, but it's very, very difficult uh, to speak about inclusion, practical inclusion, real inclusion, when we are not sharing, uh, or it's difficult, difficult to define what we are understanding what we are, uh, uh, mm, what are, is our uh, vision of these basic values. So I think, again, this is a very, very important, excellent, let's say, uh, uh, area wh where we can experiment a lot of things. Uh, it's exciting from my perspective as a researcher, but I would like to say, keep in mind that if we want, as we want, include everybody, we should be very, very practical and take into consideration that we are speaking about millions of students every day. 
Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That's very clear. And listen, how can international and national standardized assessment enhance the quality of education? Of course, uh, from my perspective, from my job, it's very, very important. Uh, it is extremely important. But to be entirely honest, uh, uh, we are able, uh, since 2000, 2010, 2005, uh, to, speak about, to compare our system because we have measures. And uh, we know very well that measures uh, are not uh, able to represent all the situation, the complexity uh, of our school system. But I, again, again, if we want to share uh, uh, common values, at least uh, uh, we should have uh, some kind of standards. I know that this word sometimes uh, is a bit excruciating, but I, I think we need it uh, in order to understand if we go in the right direction. Give you an, just to give you an example, in the pedagogic and in the educational field, we do believe, I do believe, that a, a formative assessment is extremely important. It's really, really important because we have to use the assessment, the evaluation, in order to improve the general situation of our students and of ourselves as, as well. But in order to uh, have a real, actual, formative assessment, at least we need to share some common standards. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to have uh, an effective formative assessment. And uh, I think this is very, very important, again, if we want to uh, uh, be sure that in the near future we uh, uh, at least uh, go in the right direction of, of the inclusion. Uh, uh, we should have a standard because uh, ex uh, mm, especially today with a so complex society, if we don't share, for instance, in terms of reading comprehension, in numeracy, uh, mm, scientific reasoning and whatever you want, standards, uh, I think, uh, I f I'm afraid, really, really afraid that uh, schools remains or is a place of intention and not of results. Thank you. So thank you very much, Roberto, and uh, many thanks to all the participants of this very interesting panel. Thank you very much. In a few moments, uh, we will have uh, Ilana Sicurel, It's one of the most important and awaited moments of uh, this day. We have uh, the chance to listen to Ilana Sicurel, who is a member of the European Parliament and uh, of the uh, EU Committee on Culture and Education. As she's in video conference from Brussels. If uh Okay, we hear something. Yes, Ms. Sicurel. Oh. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Yes? Finally, yes. Oh, Thank you. Ah. It's okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, so, can you hear us? Yes. It's okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We are. Uh, but I have, you know, I can hear myself. You are stuck. There is an echo. Okay. Bon, voilà. I'm ready. Okay. Buongiorno a tutti. <laughs> buonasera. Did you say buongiorno or buonasera? Buonasera, right? buonasera right now, yes. Uh, buonasera. I, I just <laughs> want to remember that Miss Sicurea will report on making the European school system the beating heart of the European education area. When you want, Miss Sicurea, yes. please. Yes. Buon, buonasera a tutte e a tutti. Mi dispiace di non poter essere fisicamente con voi. 
Sono molto felice di questo primo evento di condivisione didattica nelle scuole europee che spero sia il primo di una lunga serie. I sincerely thank Mr. Cellini and the Italian Presidency for the organization of this conference and its ambition. You are making my dream come true and a considerable step towards the wish of the members of the European Parliament to see an annual European school event to share best pedagogical practices and pool knowledge, knowledge among schools, teachers and students. Learning from each other, improving together and a way to show the broader educational world the jewel the European school system represents for Europe. Dear friends, how can we not see that the educational divides from which our societies suffer are at the heart of the political crisis that many of our countries are going through? In the same spirit of the thinking of Robert Schumann and Jean Monnet, we need to open and organize our common educational resources in Europe. As never before, Member states face the same educational challenges, such as teachers' shortages. Education has therefore become high on the European agenda. It is central to our resilience, to our regions, and to our changing labor market needs. Education is more and more considered as a common investment rather than an expense. On this, I agree with Enrico Letta, who is currently appointed to review our single market. In Europe, we need to allow for the freedom of people to stay or move while ensuring the movement of knowledge and education. And you will not be surprised if I tell you that the European school system has that potential. It is, if it reforms, towards enlarging the beneficiaries of high quality multilingual European education, which of our diversities. But what we need now is political will. As President Emmanuel Macron often says, Europe needs to become an educational power. A Europe that without departing from the sovereignty that each member state continues to exercise over its school systems, seizes the incredible strength of the European dimension to education and the exchanges of best pedagogical practices developed by our 27 education systems. It is in this kind of Europe that the European schools have their place and key role to play. You are a unique educational model that brings European excellence unity, diversity, and identity in one place of action. A treasure combining high quality multilingual education with a focus on mother tongue according to national traditions, a European curriculum born out of a combination of the different education systems and a transmission of the values and principle of the European Union. That is why, on my initiative, the European Parliament carries a new aspiration for the European school system, making it an in vivo laboratory for the development and dissemination of best pedagogical practices by ensuring it irrigates all our national education systems for the benefits of all students in Europe. Do member states see the potential of European school teachers, also for national systems? Do member states see the potential of the European baccalaureate as reference points for the quality of education across the Union? That the European schools excel in science and language learning, in teaching about Europe? The ambition of my of of uh, my parliamentary school, rep uh, sorry, my parliamentary report is therefore twofold. First, to call for a reform of the European school system that, victim of its success, is going through a growth crisis and needs a new vision for the future. Then, and this is the most innovative contribution, to make the European schools a driving force for the development of the European education area. Yet, to achieve this, 
we must not only recognize the true value of the European schools, but also the need for substantial reform in several areas. I think it is time for the European schools to move forward, concretely speaking, in full transparency and in consultation with all stakeholders on how to reap the benefits and develop further. The governance and management structures of the systems have indeed the virtue of maintaining a direct link with member states, but present clear limits in terms of governmental engagement, decision making, and accountability on school autonomy. For instance, the way teachers' recruitment works and situation, the situation of the schools in Brussels on infrastructure and overcrowding cannot last. It may not be tomorrow then that you choose for an alternative governance system, but the course needs to be set. Let's think out of the convention, out of the box. I therefore urge the European Commission to act as an owner to take the lead in performing an in-depth and independent review of the governance of the systems by the end of 2024. The current convention with unanimous voting clearly hinders the ability to make adequate change at all levels. We are not in the 1950s anymore, but 70 years later. We need to move beyond considering the European schools as corporate schools at the service only of the European institutions, they are not elitist, but a fundamental lever for European integration and regional development. This is what has started with the creation of the European accredited school. They have their part to play in fulfilling this new ambition. I insist side by side with the traditional schools who they actually outnumber. Member states should further develop them they should be given a better voice in the system and the latter should constantly stand up for the teachers and the quality of education in the accreditation procedure of these schools. Most importantly, the European Parliament called for a thorough assessment of the system and an update of its mission, principles and objectives in the form of a new charter by the end of 2024. Not a simple working group document, but a clear written and legally sound commitment. One that is fit for the 21st century and provides a revigorating vision. I truly believe that developing a shared pedagogical culture and supervision is the spearhead of the system future success across the Union. The pedagogical unit and quality assurance mechanism should be reinforced to that aim, also by allowing a structured exchange of best pedagogical practices among educational staff, member states and beyond. Inspectors should be given the time to dedicate themselves to the system and continuity should be the master word. Also structural continuity between presidencies, this is essential. Teachers have actually already understood this. They are the drivers of the European school systems and of developing the European dimension of our national systems. They are vowed to become trainers and mentors across Europe, and their skills should be formally recognized upon return in their country. That is also why their recruitment, training, status and working condition in the traditional as much as in the accredited schools should be a key priority at the center of our concern. The, the distinct feature of the European school's teachers is their exposition to different educational approaches leading to a reflective practice. Let's give them greater autonomy and the opportunity to grasp European programs, instruments and tools such as Erasmus Plus Mobility teachers academies or e-twinning. In this perspective, the European Parliament calls the European Commission to examine the crucial role of the European school system in the creation of the European education area. More particularly, in terms of pedagogical innovation, language learning, 
mutual recognition of diplomas and teaching methods with a strong European dimension. The education area is all about ensuring a greater and better flow of learners, teachers and knowledge, fostering a sense of belonging and civic awareness. How can we not see that the European schools participate in achieving the educational objectives of the Union? That there should be synergies. This can only be made possible via the involvement of the European Commission's Directorate General for Education and Culture in the European school system, which is currently and very surprisingly absent. I believe that the European Commission should be given the means to act also being the main financial contributor. The fundamental question here is not especially to spend more money on the systems of European schools, but how we spend it and how member states see the return of investments. That is why a dedicated task force of all budgetary contributors should be looking in 2025 at finding a more adequate binding and sustainable cost-sharing mechanism, one that allows the systems to fulfill its mission in line with the newly established charter, in addition to increased scrutiny and budgetary control of the European Parliament. At last, I'm very happy to see the positive response to the Parliament report and the dynamic it has created. The European school systems will be invited to come present an annual report to members of parliament as of 2024 to monitor progress on reforms and objectives. And I plea for an increasing role of our elected representative in the oversight of the system that is meant to one day adopt another government's model, allowing it to continue to be the beacon for high quality multilingual education in Europe, demonstrating that being united in diversity can also be a reality in the educational sphere. To conclude, dear friends, I call on this special occasion for political will and ambition for member states to operate a Copernican revolution by broadening the scope of the beneficiaries of the European school system, who are no long, longer just the students enrolled in the schools, but all students in Europe. A teacher once answered me in the consultation after I, I asked him what's the strength of the system and his school, we are Europe. Investing in the European schools mean investing in Europe as an educational power, rich of our diversity, which offers each member state the opportunity to take advantage of and draw inspiration from the best European educational practices. I am eager to closely look into the conclusions of your collective work during this first Teachers Forum. I hope it will be published and shared, la shared largely and I wish that in the future, this annual event will, long, will be longed for not only by the European school teachers, but by the whole European community of teachers that this event will contribute to create. I thank you for your attention. Many, many thanks to Ilana Sicurel for sharing her thoughts on the challenges and opportunities facing European education today. And of course, good luck for the next European election. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so we are uh, nearing the end of the forum. I would like to invite to the table Amil Karebori, former inspector of the European School and external observer of the event for the Concluding remarks. Please, Amilcare.
First of all, uh, uh, let me thank you, uh, my former colleagues, uh, Mrs. Uh, Diana Saccardo and uh, Carlo Rubinacci, who unfortunately can't be here because of um, some health problems, uh, and uh, Mrs. Fantinato for uh, inviting me here. I'm, uh, uh, I left the, school, uh, the European school system uh, and the Italian school system six years uh, ago. So for me, it's a great pleasure to be a bit back uh, with participating uh, at your first uh, forum. Uh, when I asked what my job was, uh, I was told uh, to be a critical friend. And the first thing that I came to my mind is uh, an old sage, an old Italian sage, which says, uh, dal <coughs> dai nemici mi guardo io, dagli amici mi guardi Dio. From enemies I guard myself, from friends God guards me. And uh, uh, so I hope <laughs> not to, uh, to, uh, to confute this, uh, this, uh, this saying. Uh, what um, everything important uh, has been uh, already said so i've been uh, keeping uh, in renewing uh, my f i call what i call the field notes because i've been there on uh, taking notes of what you said but you you have said almost everything and what was necessary uh, to say about the european schools so I limit to f just few, mm, uh, stress the things you already said. Uh, maybe one thing which uh, was interesting for, mm, for you is, since I was invited, kindly invited by the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in the person of Ambassador Filippo La Rosa to participate to the selecting committee of the projects uh, um, have um, some background information uh, about the, the project. Uh, and uh, uh, I can go off, uh, forward. I need some technical help. I'll be this one. Yeah, no. This one we jump. We jump and we go there. Uh, we received uh, 40 projects uh, and uh, 40 proposals uh, and you can see the uh, breaking down of the number of pro proposal according to the team of the workshop and you can see the uh, received a lot of proposals from on the team of inclusion and second uh, very strong team was plurilingual and cultural education and then uh, came the uh, early childhood education and care and sustainable development artificial intelligence uh, and last the uh, early childhood education uh, and care uh, it was quite difficult uh, to make a choice uh, which uh, project to select we decided to pay the uh, a lot of attention to the degree of pedagogical and didactic innovation embodied by each project. But this one has to be, this, um, has to be uh, balanced with other features of the project, uh, such as the degree of curricular integration, the relevance of European dimension, and the student-centeredness uh, and learning differentiation. And this uh, aspect of the student-centeredness will come back again. And, uh, Unfortunately, some projects had to be excluded because they didn't provide uh, enough information. We weren't, they were very good, they looked very good, but there wasn't enough uh, information about the project. So we didn't know what, uh, uh, how to evaluate them. So maybe for, the, for, for future forum, it would be worth uh, uh, doing a bit of work on, uh, on this uh, uh, selection uh, process. Uh, another important aspect, aspect was the repli re, re, replicability 
of the of the initiative and uh, the suitability to be presented uh, in a relatively short uh, workshop uh, in uh, in an interactive uh, manner with the with the participant and it hasn't been easy at all during i participated also the uh, some of the workshop uh, and the buzzwords which i heard during the workshop but also uh, i heard them resounding in this room uh, where uh, and on learning active learning child or student centered learning cooperative learning inquiry based learning these are most of these words or all of them they belong to uh, a language which is familiar to me because they go back uh, to the last century so these are things that schools uh, have been struggling to achieve for quite a long time and it doesn't surprise me they haven't been uh, completely achieved yet because innovation as my mentor used to say is one of the most difficult things to achieve uh, in schools i'll go um, briefly to uh, some of the projects which impress me very much uh, i was very impressed by uh, the legio hate uh, challenge project uh, uh, carried out in uh, European school Karlsruhe because uh, um, it show, showed us what um, if um, short time before Professor Alessandra Romano uh, said about uh, uh, dispelling um, uh, debunking some uh, prejudice about uh, um, special need education in the Legio project, they try and, uh, I mean, it's a complex uh, <laughs> project and there are very facets into it. But the, the thing which struck me was the idea of uh, integrating uh, high achiever students uh, with neurodiverse secondary school students. And this is, was done by broadening the educational offer beyond the ordinary curricular activities. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it, was what, it was quite something. Uh. Of course, uh, I mean, uh, it's not a panacea for all this uh, kind of problem. It was just uh, limited to a sp specific or specific cases. Uh, but I think it was a real, uh, uh, something really remarkable. Another... Mm, area of great interest uh, for me and uh, not just for me was that of the plurilingual intercultural uh, education and I won't go into the intricacies of the plurilinguism uh, were so well explained by Professor Kunan but um, let me mm, remind what uh, a team of uh, uh, international expert uh, um, visiting uh, the, the European schools um, some time ago they were reviewing the secondary school curriculum they said that they said that uh, the team of expert was from the Institute of Education uh, University of London uh, uh, they said that language learning and, and intercultural communication were or are the core of the European school Genesis and Ethos. Uh, what I found uh, uh, interesting uh, the strong uh, stress we have on um, plurilingual, uh, you know, plurilingual education and uh, less uh, awareness uh, of the inter intercultural. Uh, education I mean uh, w m be careful uh, um, I mean uh, that uh, it's not the intercultural education is not uh, 
practiced, but it's not given uh, all the emphasis. But this one is for because uh, it's practiced every day. If you go, uh, if you look at what uh, is said in the in the text sealed into the foundation or stones of which European schools, uh, uh, we can. I'm not going to read uh, the text. You can read it by yourself. But you see. Uh, sorry, it's shown. Uh, it has moved on my screen, but it's not. No, something has gone wrong. I need uh, technical help. I will. Uh, It's going uh, on on my screen, uh, but it's not going on, uh, so I have to read it, uh, sorry, for you. I mean, uh, waiting for the somebody to help, um, I have to go to read it. Uh. Educated side by side, uh, here we come. Untroubled from infancy by divisive, uh, ah, we're touching, uh, this one. Uh. Educated side by side, and troubled from infancy by divisive uh, prejudices, acquired uh, with all uh, that is great and good uh, in the different cultures, he will be born in upon them as they mature, that they belong together without ceasing uh, to look to their own lands with love and pride, they will become in mind, Europeans, schooled and ready to complete and consolidate the work of their fathers before them to bring into being a united and thriving Europe. So this one is what actually our schools are doing day by day. But having said that, yesterday we were presented with two examples uh, during the workshop of intercultural education in action. They were given by the European School of Karlsruhe and the European School of uh, Luxembourg. Uh, I found also interesting uh, uh, the awareness uh, of, of uh, our students have uh, about uh, uh, the European uh, values uh, and democratic uh, Synthesis. And this one was recognized by the study carry on, carried out by the uh, committee selected by the chosen by the um, by, by the experts selected by the education uh, uh, the cultural education committee of the European Parliament. They they say that. Uh, European values and democratic citizenship represents one of the strongest uh, aspects uh, of the European school system. And it is based not only on the curriculum, but also via extracurricular activities, such as uh, study trips, uh, EU models, uh, and inter-school competitions, as well as uh, the multicultural uh, educational environment uh, there is evidence of high quality educational resources developed across uh, several schools. And we have uh, uh, a testimony of that with the um, experience uh, carried out by the Berkendel School in Brussels too, uh, where we have a true um, experimental uh, uh, carried out in nursery and primary school in teaching these uh, uh, values. We saw that also in the report this morning. And that reminds me of what, uh, I mean, they were very young children. They were uh, nursery uh, uh, and primary school children. So I, I, one can wonder, how can we teach uh, democratic citizenship to very, very young uh, uh, children? If that's possible. Uh, it, it reminds me of what uh, uh, a famous cognitive psychologist of the last century, Jerome Brunner, 
used to say, some, any subject can be taught uh, effectively in, in some intellectually honest form to any child at any stage of development. And Jerome Brunner was quite familiar here because he used to visit the, the experience of the nursery school in, uh, in Reggio. And uh, it's proving true what he, he said. Also uh, fascinating the, the early childhood uh, uh, education experiment carried out in the European School of Strasbourg with the Kamisha Bai, uh, this uh, popular pre-television form of, uh, of narrative which uh, was uh, resumed to, to, to making pupils aware of the environmental uh, problems facing uh, our seas. Uh, uh, the Voluve web radio, that was already said, but um, as soon as I saw the project, uh, he, he recalled me of the l'imprimerie à l'école, the printing press invented uh, by the, the French uh, educationalist and uh, educator Celestine Frenet which in, in, uh, in, in my days, uh, when I, I, I used to learn uh, in, in teaching, was, uh, was a real uh, authority. And the father of the, what was called the active learning uh, movement, and we come back to the, the buzzword uh, I was mentioned before. And uh, sustainable development also was uh, fascinating. Uh, we have we, yeah, we have very, very good uh, performance from our students. Uh, according to the 2022 OECD PISA study carried out uh, on, uh, on the uh, European uh, schools, uh, in comparison also with other OECD schools, uh, uh, shows that 95% uh, of our 15 years old students uh, declare that they know something about climate change and they could explain the issue in general terms. Uh, the, that, the percentage for, for comparison for the, uh, in the other uh, European, uh, sorry, in the other school, the, in, in the other uh, OECD schools was 79%, so it's quite quite big difference. Uh, but despite this, the, the, the study of the uh, sponsored by the European Parliament uh, shows that only a minority of the European school students, 45%, judge the quality of education, sustainable development positively or very positively. Maybe I explain this with the fact that probably they are more aware of the environmental problem than their fellow st students in other schools. That, that's my explanation. In this area, there are, there are uh, very, very nice uh, progress uh, and the project presented by uh, here, they were very interesting. Uh, the one uh, uh, presented by the European School of München uh, has showed uh, uh, a very good example of what was mentioned uh, during one of the lectures of the uh, whole uh, democratic uh, school approach uh, to actively involve secondary school students uh, in the reduction of the climate footprint uh, through a form of experiential learning. That was very, very interesting. Uh, the workshop on artificial intelligence, as, as, as uh, you, have, you may have gathered, uh, it was the most difficult for me to follow because uh, I uh, belong uh, uh, in, the, in the, what is called the generational gap uh, on the artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm on the uh, losing side uh, of the gap, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, I take up the plea of Professor uh, Roncaglia to provide uh, alternative, uh, to provide artificial intelligence, long life learning facilities, uh, especially for people of, of my age. <laughs> but uh, it was very interesting to see, but unfortunately I, I couldn't uh, 
uh, do any active work. The, 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 the workshop was very, uh, were very uh, factual, like all the workshop. And that's one recommendation was given uh, uh, that uh, they, they needed to be a workshop where the participant actually did things. So apply the, the principle of the uh, active learning themselves. And uh, uh, before, yes, I'm coming to my concluding uh, uh, remarks. Uh, the, the, the Parma Teachers Forum has been the first event designed along the line proposed by the European Parliament resolution of the 12th September uh, last year, 2023. In particular, there were three aims uh, of the Italian presidents uh, to provide an occasion for professional development uh, and the exchange of good practice between practices between the teacher of European schools and teachers in the Italian schools, to promote the sharing of innovative teaching experiences within the European system, and to offer an opportunity for the national system to learn about the pedagogical worth of the European schools. I think uh, all uh, three of these aims have been uh, very successfully uh, achieved. Uh, there is one criticism, one criticism I, I, I'm afraid I have to, to, to make, uh, and the criti criticism is that there was too much food for thought, uh, not just for thought. <laughs> so, uh, I think the uh, uh, coming together of uh, practitioner, practitioners and experts uh, is uh, highly commendable because the best practices uh, are a bit like fruit. Good fruits sprout from plants that need to be properly cared for and it is the same for good practices. They don't uh, start, uh, they're not spontaneous. So it will be useful uh, for the future to think about a system for supporting innovative teachers and innovative schools. In the case of the European schools, such a system should bring, should bring together also recurring to the networking power of new technologies, not just teachers, but school directors and the pedagogical development team of the secretariat, as well as external exp experts. And if I understand correctly, the word of Madame, of the M MEP, Madame Sicurel, the political uh, will is behind that. And if I understand correctly the word uh, of the sec Secretary General, uh, Mr. Andreas Beckman, and uh, of the President of the Board of the, of the Governors, uh, the, this is the, in the intention. Regarding the teachers, the buzzword uh, where, uh, where I heard uh, very often uh, where, where creativity, motivation, uh, passion. And uh, I'm uh, confident uh, that you go back from the, this forum uh, to your school uh, with some new ideas and primarily with the desire to explore new ideas with your students and colleagues, with uh, a reinvigorated enthusiasm for your job, enthusiasm which, uh, according to a great French uh, writer, Albert Camus, is the very secret of a successful teacher. And, uh, it is with this uh, plain uh, and wise word uh, 
that uh, I would like uh, to conclude my speech. As uh, you know, uh, the, um, Albert Camus was very grateful to his teacher. The, the real name was uh, Monsieur Germain. And there is, uh, if you haven't read it, a, a beautiful exchange of letters between the two. And uh, uh, in his uh, book, uh, Le Nouvel Homme, he wrote, then he was off to class with Mr. Bernard, which in the real life was Monsieur Germain. This class was always interesting for the simple reason that he loved this job so passionately. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Amit Garibaldi, former inspector of, of the European schools. Three final statements will conclude the second and final day of the Teachers' Forum. First is uh, by Diana Saccardo. I call her again here at the table, inspector of the Italian Ministry of Education and Merit and for the secondary cycle of the European schools. Diana Saccardo. <laughs> Sorry for being here again. So, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be addressing such a distinguished audience at this very important event, the first edition of the Teachers Forum during the Italian turn of presidency of the European schools. On behalf of the Italian Ministry of Education and Merit, I bring greetings from the head of department for, uh, for the National System of Education and Training, Mrs. Carmela Palumbo, and the Director General, Mr. Fabrizio Manca, both of whom send their sincere apologies for being unable to attend the Teachers Forum and their best wishes for its present and future success. On behalf of the Ministry of Education and Merit, I wish to express our gratitude to all the people who offered their contribution to this event. Your commitment to devote time and energy to the Teachers Forum is very much appreciated. I'm grateful for the hard work and dedication of all the participants in the forum. And finally, an event like this doesn't come together overnight. That is why I also want to express my deepest gratitude to the team who coordinated this extraordinary event over several months, in particular to Mrs. Roberta Fantinato, the director of the school. Let's give her an applause. I wish to recall that in 1951, six countries, Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg, signed the treaty to create the European Coal and Steel Community, which is considered the origin of the European Union. The European School Project was developed two years later, in October um, 1953, in Luxembourg, by a group of parents who worked for the community in Luxembourg. In 1957, the governments of the six um, member states who founded the um, European Coal and Steel Community signed the statute of the European School, which took the form of an international treaty. All this to say that Italy is one of the founding countries and we are very proud. Why has Italy, and in particular the Ministry of Education and Merit that I represent here today in cooperation with the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs decided to support the first edition of the Teacher Forum? I've identified four main reasons, so this is a sort of recap because all these concepts have already been expressed uh, several times uh, during these two days. 
teachers are the key actors in implementing school policy in the classroom. Teachers have the ability to build positive and inspire future generations, both on a local and European scale. So, those who have an impact on the children of society have the power to change lives, not just for those children themselves, but for the lives of all. They can be a role model and an inspiration to go further and to dream bigger. Second reason, the ambition, as I said before, the ambition of the European Education Area is to give access to quality and inclusive education and training to all by 2025. To make this ambition come true, it is crucial for any school system, including the European school system, to have competent, engaged, and motivated teachers. Therefore, they need to continuously develop their skills. Initial training and continual professional development, uh, development must be of the highest quality. Third um, reason, as this has already been said, one of the recommendations included in the European Parliament's report that was published in September 2023 is to create an annual celebratory event to share pedagogical best practice, pool knowledge among schools, teachers and students, and showcase their work and projects to the broader system, with national education representatives being invited in order to raise awareness of the European, education, uh, European uh, school system. This recommendation as I said before, is reflected in one of the priorities of the Italian presidency of the European schools. Fourth reason, last but not least, we wanted to launch an alternative opportunity for continuous professional development, which we consider essential for the well-being of teachers and for effective student learning. Very often, the contents of training programs for teachers are based on an external view of what knowledge and skills teachers need to be equipped with. Another limitation of the traditional in-service model of teachers' CPD is the separation from teachers' daily work. It is an approach which is unlikely to support interaction and collective learning opportunities among teachers. With the Teachers Forum, we aim to offer teachers authentic opportunities to learn from and with colleagues from European schools and Italian schools. That is, being active participants in the thinking and learning process. I think that this is being an example of situated learning, where learning has develops from experience and social interaction with other members who have similar issues and concerns from the realm of practice. That is why we have attached so great importance and dedicated a large amount of time to workshops. The ambition is to have thrown a seed for the creation of a community of practice where the key word is collaboration. We hope that the process started will continue under the next presidency. As we bring our teacher forum to a close, I once again thank you all for allowing us to be here today. And I hope that this event has given, something, some, uh, given you all something useful to bring home with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diana Saccardo in spite of the Italian Ministry of Education and Merit. Second statement by Filippo La Rosa, Deputy Director from the Promotion of the Italian Culture and Language in the General Directorate for Public and Cultural Diplomacy of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs.
good afternoon to everybody, uh, to Mr. Cianini, uh, to, uh, with, in a certain way, the deus ex machina of these uh, two days and all the other activities that we will follow this couple of days, I mean the Board of Governors. And uh, I would like to, to thank and express my gratitude and the gratitude of my team to Roberta Fantinato, who's hosting this uh, uh, Teachers Forum here in marvelous city of Parma, and uh, as well thanking the two representatives of the Minister of Education and Merit, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Sacardo and Mr. Rubinacci, who's not here. And first of all, uh, I would like to to thank all of you who still are joining at uh, this late hour, uh, this, uh, this event and listening speakers who are addressing you. Uh, some years ago, in 1989, I was uh, one of the very first students who joined the Erasmus program. I left the La Sapienza University of Rome uh, and I went to Barcelona, Spain, uh, and I was one of the very first students of the Erasmus program. I always felt myself like one of uh, Sofia Corradi guys. And um, now years are ro rolled by me, and uh, here we are. Uh, education is crucial. We've been hearing and listening in this sentence uh, several times along this day, and uh, it's crucial uh, for itself, and it, it's crucial if we consider this sentence in the international scenario, if we have a look out of this room and we go uh, to have a quick look of what is going on in the world. Education is crucial today and will be even more crucial in the coming years when um, we need uh, to have a young generation uh, much more well-educated to, to be successful in the international competition. Uh, I think that the second part of this sentence is uh, is important to, to have in mind because uh, we sometimes, we are used to say or listen, education is crucial, it's important, it's relevant. Okay, but why? Why? Because we need to uh, reinforce and uh, to strengthen uh, the pillars of our, of our society. Uh, school and education are changing. Uh, in the mid-50s, when uh, the European school was created, uh, and a European school in Brussels or in other places was pretty different from an ordinary school everywhere in Europe. Uh, our century later, uh, this difference is not so wide. Uh, because the school has changed and the society has changed as well, pretty well. I've, I would say that the society changed and consequently this school, the school has changed as well. But this change uh, make us understand that uh, we are facing a different uh, situation which is an opportunity. Uh, this uh, similarity between the European school system and uh, ordinary schools throughout all Europe is an opportunity because the case state that can represent the school where you teach, it's uh, a sort of a case study to better understand 
which is the path to follow in the coming years and in the coming decades. I will repeat my, my sentence again. Education is key. Uh, but uh, when I assume my function as a director for the promotion of Italian language and culture abroad some months ago, uh, I wanted to uh, make a difference to, okay, this is a refrain, but make this refrain effective. And uh, that is why I really supported the realization of this couple of days of dialogue, listening, talking about school uh, with one of the two pillars of the school. Uh, school is made of a lot of uh, entities, a lot of subjects, but there are two basic pillars, students and teachers. And uh, we consider that uh, listening from you and make you listen uh, where school is going, where school is going, and which is uh, the best way to follow. Uh, it was an important step that we have to realize. And this is why, as the Italian presidency, we did all this what possible to do to realize this couple of days. Um, I've been listening to you since half ten of this morning, half past ten, and uh, I listen to lots of interesting suggestions, ideas, project. Uh, I didn't expect something different because you are the experts of this subject, you are the pillars of school, so that is normal. What I think that uh, this approach of uh, inclusiveness, I mean, include teachers in the decision progress and uh, make, reach the board of governor, your ideas, your uh, point of view, it's uh, something that will be taken account uh, in the rest of the week when different subjects will talk about uh, the European schools. Um, I will finish just underline a couple of, uh, I will quote a couple of people who have been speaking from this uh, table uh, in the previous hours. The representative of uh, European School of Brussels uh, made a slogan here, go beyond. Uh, I think that was a good slogan, two crucial words, uh, even because she underlined that um, it was important to, to include uh, uh, individuality, even in the matters of uh, rules and laws. And the second one is uh, uh, the expert of uh, uh, IA. I think was German, was set here, and um, he, he stretched one word, effort. Uh, we have to remember that if we want to be competitive in the competition that I uh, mentioned before, uh, we are also, uh, we have to do our best to make the young generation understand that effort is still uh, is still a work on, on the table. I, I stop here in um, wishing uh, to all of you uh, a good come back to your houses, to your school, and to the Board of Governors, uh, very good and fruitful jobs. And uh, please listen and remarks what has been told here in this couple of days. Thank you very much.
Many thanks to Filippo La Rosa, Deputy Director, for the promotion of the Italian culture of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Antonio Cenini, President of the Board of Governors of the European Schools, will give the final speech of this international forum. Antonio. Grazie, can you hear me? Uh, before uh, starting my speech, uh, I would like to ask Andreas if you want to join me on the stage, uh, because I think that uh, uh, I, we've been working together, let's say, from the first moment, and uh, we are a family and we are a system, so it's, uh, uh, it, it would be good to share, and also, of course, if you want to have some words, uh, uh, also this final moment. Uh, Thank, very, thank, thank you very much, Diana, and thank you very much, Director La Rosa, for your intervention. Also for the historical background, it's very important. Um, and dear teachers, so yesterday at the beginning we I said that uh, uh, this, was, uh, this teacher's forum was uh, an exceptional opportunity to do something important for the system. And uh, I told you, see you tomorrow at the end, uh, and uh, we will wrap up and, uh, and see if it was worth. So I think that uh, in my mind, uh, uh, everything went uh, very much ahead of our expectation, our best expectation, and this is uh, thanks to your participation. And uh, I, I would like to give an applause to you for what you did. <laughs> this is only the first applause I will, I will call for. Uh, I think that uh, Everybody uh, today feels uh, more uh, aware and uh, confident about the potential of the system and, uh, and the necessity to preserve it and to make it stronger. And uh, in my opinion, um, the three most important, uh, uh, let's say, uh, results we achieved, uh, not concerning the, the, the contents, but concerning the things to do. Uh, today we all understand uh, that we have a really a hidden, a hidden treasure. Europe has a hidden treasure, which is the European school system. But also we understand that uh, uh, we need to do more to make it uh, uh, more famous uh, uh, among it, uh, European citizens. So uh, the first uh, task I would like to to set for from tomorrow on is to do as much as possible to communicate better at all level the system um, and to really um, keep everybody aware uh, about the importance of the system. We will have the honor to, um, at the end of the Board of Governors this week to have the Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Tajani coming to close the Board of Governors, which is something uh, very important. And uh, I really hope that uh, from now on, uh, the political authorities uh, will uh, give the importance the, the system uh, deserves uh, uh, in, the, in the coming years. The second uh, mm, point is that uh, we really uh, disseminated a lot during these two days. So. I would like uh, to ask to Roberta, to all the colleagues, uh, to do uh, our best all together, uh, to put together the results of, uh, of the work to today and to disseminate it. So I don't know if you want to work to create a, a real report and maybe uh, make it uh, something annual, uh, so the report of the Teachers Forum. I don't know, it's just a suggestion, but uh, it's among the to-dos I would like to, to have. And uh, mm, the third point uh, we already know, and it's already been decided. Uh, let's try to work together also for, uh, with the incoming presidencies to make this moment of exchange of best practices a permanent problem, um, moment uh, and um, to improve the exchanges also between the European level, so the European schools and the national schools, which is uh, the um, big added value also of this exercise. What happens now? So tomorrow at 9.30, uh, we will uh, start uh, the last Board of Governors uh, uh, chaired by, by Italy. Uh, we have a very, very important agenda. 
uh, we will discuss uh, the follow-up of the um, European Parliament's report, uh, the action plan. Uh, we will discuss about the vision and mission for the European schools. We will also approve uh, a more, let's say, political declaration, the Parma declaration, keeping, uh, let's say, high the ambition of, uh, of uh, what we want to do um, uh, for the future of the European school. Uh, on this, uh, uh, I, I listened very carefully what Ms. Sikurel said, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an enthusiastic uh, one uh, concerning the reform, but also, and I look at Andreas, uh, uh, I understand that uh, we must find the right balance between uh, ambition and reality. So uh, uh, we, 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 we must keep the ambition high, but also our feet uh, <laughs> on, the, on the floor. So tomorrow we will start this discussion, but I'm sure that uh, we will be able to find uh, the right balance uh, uh, to uh, keep the, um, the system going and, uh, and to, to make the necessary reforms. Um, I in particular, I want to welcome uh, uh, our colleague uh, Ioannis, uh, who will uh, take the baton from the Italian presidency with the, and all the, um, his delegation. I also, I want to applaud them. Uh, yeah, you understand that now your agenda is uh, really full and uh, the expectations are very high, but uh, uh, as, uh, on behalf of the Italian presidency, I want to reassure that we are committed to providing you all the support. Uh, of course, uh, uh, to keep uh, the, uh, the format of the Teachers Forum uh, uh, strong, uh, to help you to organize the, the, the second edition, which will be even better than, than the first edition. So, uh, and uh, okay, at the end, uh, I, I want to thank everybody. So I, I could spend uh, 20 minutes, uh, thanks everybody. But of course, Roberta Fantinato, <laughs> we, um, uh, we were joking and say we are a copia di fatto because uh, we've been working very closely for, for three months and uh, and uh, but uh, thanks for what you did uh, it was fantastic uh, thanks to all uh, of course uh, uh, the Italian team the three ministries involved uh, thanks to, to the teachers to Andreas uh, to the team uh, um, and uh, this time I, I would like to, to ask for the last applause for everybody, so it must be very loud. <laughs> and uh, just to, to finish my intervention, uh, I want to say Viva l'Europa e Viva le Scuole Europee. And Andreas, if you want to say a word also. Yes, thank you very much. I will be very brief, but first of all, I would like to, to thank you sincerely. Does it work? Yes, I think so. For your nice gesture to, to join you, because I think, in, in fact, uh, uh, united, we, we, are, we are stronger, and I think this is, uh, your presidency is, is a very good example for that. Um, and I'm also very grateful for, yeah, we are going for the follow-up of the Parliament's report, and um, you have listened to Madame Sicorel as rapporteur, uh, it's not a secret that I don't support entirely all the recommendations, but it, this is not the purpose. It is good that the report triggers the discussion, that we look very critical at ourselves and see how we can improve, and we, I think we will have very, very interesting um, discussions um, in the three days ahead of us in the Board of Governors. Um, obviously, I, I, I really thank you, Antonio, for your chairmanship um, during the Italian presidency, for taking the initiative of the forum. I've said it earlier, I've said it to Madame Sircorel when I met her twice in the parliament. I, I was very skeptical if we can have at such short notice um, this uh, forum and I think it was really, um, and you asked this rhetorical question, was it worse to do it? Yes, absolutely, it was worse to do it and it is even more it is even more important to continue, to make it not a one-shot, but to continue under the Cypriot presidency. <laughs> and I think these are my, my final words for today. Uh, I will have to speak like you a, a lot in the next three days, but I would like really to thank again 
um, the whole school community, the Italian presidency team. So you have said, Viva Europe. I say also, Viva Italia. Grazie mille. Thank you to uh, Antonio Cennini and Andreas Beckmann. You, you, no, sorry, it's better to switch off. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Antonio Cennini and Andreas Beckmann. You can stay at the table. As we conclude two remarkable days of the forum, we extend our thanks uh, to everyone for participation. I remind you again that you can find and download all the material from these two days of forum on the website of the European School of uh, Parma. This event marks a significant first step towards opening the European school system to the Italian national system, fostering a valuable exchange of ideas that will enrich both. But I want to leave the last words to Roberta Fantinato, director of Accredited School of Parma, who organized this fantastic two days of meeting. Roberta. Now we can drink, so it's uh, very important for our well-being. <laughs> I thank you, Stefano Tura, our journalist uh, who accepted to moderate. It's like a war, but uh, it was well done, so thank you to Stefano. He's used to war, but... Um, Thank you to everyone. Uh, we are very happy because we were scared at the beginning that no one uh, were, could be interested or interested in our forum. So we are very, very happy. A special thanks to my staff. <laughs> and now Fabrizio and Fabio, because it was a great, great and excellent work. They are over there. Fabrizio, tomorrow we have got to put everything on the website. At 8.30, we'll be ready. <laughs> And to all my staff, the teacher, but also the administrative staff, because it was really a great work. Thank you to Diana Saccardo, great partner. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, to all uh, the ministry, Sabina, Santa Rosa, Donato Scioscioli, my beloved Alessandro Bosco, who is not here, but we extend my colleague and uh, Dr. Cenini. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have... Uh, the, mm, the closing reception. You will receive in one or two days uh, an evaluation for two evaluation form. One is for workshop, so you will have to evaluate. It's very simple and very quick, the workshop. And one is for the forum, so we can collect the data and understand with data what is working and what is not working. So Cyprus will have a good beginning and we can help them in this. <laughs> we, we are not so envious, but uh, it's uh, interesting. So thank you. And uh, now closing rece reception at 7.30, there will be the buses for the center of Parma. Have a nice reception and thank you to all the colleagues uh, that I see by remote and that they are here. It was a great pleasure to have us in Parma.